All right. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thanks for you guys for coming on. Uh, it's a little different. We don't usually have two guests on here, but um, the, it's a significant event having MSU and and uh, Chris you on because you guys were the command team of the 17th when the transition from ACC to AFSOC. So um, I thought it was important to you know, Chris, you brought it up. You were, you were like, hey, if we're going to talk about that transition, we ought to have MS on as well. I think that's a, that was a great idea. Um, but let's first um, let's take us through your beginnings and uh, talk mm-hmm. about, you know, how you got in the Air Force and, or excuse me, how you got in the military because you were in the Navy first. And then, um, you know, talk about your transition over to the Air Force and, the, and we'll go from there. Yeah. So you guys take it away uh, and let's hear, let's hear how you got in the, in the military. Great. Hey, thanks, J.D., for having me on. And, and Matt, I wanted to say you look pretty squared away. I don't think I've seen your hair that short, or <laughs> I don't see a beard. Your hair is too, yeah. <laughs> don't get Look, your hair cut for a brag. That's all I got to say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> looking, looking pretty good. Well, 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 thanks, J.D. Yeah, it's an honor to be invited. And again, when you uh, asked me to be on, I said, well, I don't know if my stories are as interesting. I, I would say I do have a, a, a perspective, uh, but I, yeah, definitely needed MS Match like on because we were such a strong team at Benning. But, uh, but real quick, so um, I was kind of born into a military family. My dad was a Marine officer. He was in Vietnam when I was born, Fort Ord Hospital there at uh, Monterey. Uh, my mom was living in Carmel. And uh, so he retired as a, a, a USMCR. I was raised in Southern California. My stepdad was in the Air Force out of Norton. So uh, my grandfather, he had been in World War II. He was a National Guard in Wisconsin, a bootlegger in the <laughs> early 30s. And he was the first sergeant, actually, of his uh, infantry company. Wow. And then he fought in the Pacific, he got a battlefield commission, ended the war. Um, he was getting ready to pin on 06, actually. So, wow. Um, you know, Silver Star winner. And then he did 30 years. So I kind of grew up with a military family and I knew I would use it to pay for college. Uh, so my dad and my parents got divorced. So he was down in San Diego, kind of a bachelor. I would spend time with him. And he always said, hey, you know, you need to go to the Marine Corps or go to the Naval Academy. <laughs> so I kind of had that seed planted uh, in high school. Um, so I had applied. I had a Marine ROTC scholarship to USC, applied for the Army. Interestingly enough, I had zero interest in the Air Force. <laughs> that was the one service I didn't apply to. Uh, I got a very late appointment to uh, Navy. I uh, went there, thought I was going to go to the Marine Corps. Uh, did a lot of the training to be a Marine officer, but realized I didn't have the, quite the right personality. Those guys are pretty hard. <laughs> you, you, you know, I mean, to be a Marine, you got to you got to be all in, right? Kind of like being a Ranger. I mean, sure. you got to be all in. So, um, so I decided uh, didn't want to be in a ship. Uh, maybe Navy Air, best background. Um, my vision, I didn't pass the uh, the test. You had to be a pilot. You had to have twenty twenty vision. So I was able to go through as a naval flight officer. Um, to be honest, at at school, you could have been uh, last in the class, but if you had perfect eyesight, you got a pilot slot. So oh, go yeah. figure. But uh, I met my wife there. She's a classmate of mine, and uh, she was actually a Navy pilot. Uh, she went through the uh, jet phase. So. Uh, CQ flew uh, T2s, A4s. Uh, she actually got recommended by her skipper to go to F14s, but of course, women were excluded from combat roles oh, right. back in the back in the day. Uh, she was a Navy brat. Her dad flew A4s, A7s in Vietnam. I was actually there when her dad pinned his wings on, so it was kind of neat. Oh, cool. Um, and so my first assignment, I was at NAS Oceana, Virginia Beach, and she was flying uh, C9s with every uh, Navy Reserve Squad and had a active duty officer attached okay. to him. So. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so I did seven and a half years in the Navy. I was in a two uh, Tomcat squadrons, uh, both great experiences out of Oceania to uh, Mediterranean cruises on the, the Saratoga. The Saratoga, the previous cruise, they had done the Desert Storm cruise. So I got to hear all the stories. Uh, the Air Wing, they lost a few aircraft, they had some POWs. Uh, there was uh, one Hornet, I think Speicher was the, the pilot. I think they eventually found his remains. So I got to hear all the cool stories about, you know, flying over Iraq. I was defending Virginia Beach at the time. So <laughs> if, you, if you guys recall the 90s, you know, there wasn't a lot of, you know, combat and even Desert sure. Storm was so short. And yeah. Matt, I don't know. Did, when did you uh, get join the Air Force? Um, After April Desert of Storm? Yeah, April of 91. That's right. Okay. Yeah, because I knew we were pretty similar so uh but you know first cruise summer med cruise great place to be uh you know the mediterranean uh you know so when it's peacetime typically you know the carrier battle groups kind of steaming all over the the mediterranean and you're usually doing exercises with various nato nations uh you know defending the carrier or you know kind of mixing it up 
you know, a lot of great port visits. So a lot of fun. Then I ended up uh, transitioning. I did another ops uh, squadron, VF-41, the Black Aces. And if you saw the last Top Gun movie, uh, some of the guys are wearing the Black Aces patch. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, flying the Super Hornets. But what's interesting, VF-41, uh, we were the first squadron to do the FAC A, TAC A role oh, and nice. uh, doing CAS. So my first tour of the F-14, it was, a, it was basically it was a fleet defender, right? It was... Uh, uh, but it was a very adaptable platform. So it became kind of an air to ground platform. Uh, so my first tour is more of a kind of a dumb visual, you know, bomber. Um, I was there before they got the lantern pods, but again, but we were doing the fact attack and roll a lot of close air support, which is fun. You know, we do a lot of strafe and uh, uh, pretty interesting. And yeah. just one real quick story. This was a 95 that I would always tell folks, you know, to compare and contrast the Navy and the air force. Uh, you know, both obviously professional, great organizations, but the Navy and I say the Navy Marine Corps is so flexible and dynamic. You know, the, the Air Force is this big machine, right? The Navy Marine Corps will never win a war, but I, I think they're able to react faster. So it was the end of our cruise. In fact, during that cruise, uh, we did some Southern watch over, went to the Suez Canal, you know, flying over Southern uh, Iraq. Uh, we were actually in Bosnia. If you remember, I was when O'Grady and his F-16 got shot down. Oh, yeah. They're flying out of Aviano. So we were in the same airspace. We kind of joked because the Navy, we were like a roving motorcycle gang flying all over the place, <laughs> not too disciplined. And O'Grady's cap, because we actually got a debrief, you know, they were like picture perfect uh, racetrack cap patterns. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I remember that was pretty intense. You know, we thought he was gone. And, uh, you know, then when, you know, he, he popped up uh, and was rescued uh, by our forces, you know, a week and a half later, it was a, you know, yeah, kind of eye opening. Sure. Um, and then after that, the, the ROE change, and then most of our missions were actually in the Adriatic. It, we couldn't go feet dry. So, no. um, but again, for the most part, I would say still kind of a peacetime cruise. So we were getting ready. Anyways, our cruise is basically at an end. We were getting ready to pull into Rhodes, uh, Greece, right? Rhodes is one of the big party spots of the Mediterranean. <laughs> and we were, uh, in fact, we had a meeting. So typically air wing JOs, when we pull in, we would have duty every three or four days as a boat officer, right? On there would be a ferry that would get all the, you know, the ship's company out to the port yeah. and you'd be there just, you'd be a scapegoat and something bad happened. Right? <laughs> it was one of the duties. So we were getting ready for the boat meeting. All of a sudden we could feel the carrier just doing those 180 degree turn. It's hard to feel a carrier move and we could feel it moving. And we're like, what's going on? The, mo the meeting was canceled. Back then we had satellite TV. So CNN was, was on in the ready room. And uh, so downtown, I guess Sarajevo had been, there was uh, some mortar fire or there was, Matt, you probably remember that. Um, there was like the shelling of civilians mm -hmm. uh, in Bosnia. So anyways, yeah, but yeah. no kidding, the next night, uh, our air wings actually launched combat missions. Um, we didn't go, I think we launched some Hornets. We're still pretty far away, but, wow. but the point is to go on a peacetime footing we're going into a port the next day and then we're steaming back. In fact, our really, we were getting relieved by the Eisenhower. They're already in the Gulf or, or well, I think they're still in the Atlantic, but to on a wartime footing. So uh, wow. for a couple of weeks and they called it Operation Deliberate Force and we actually dropped some bombs, actually dropped more in the Navy there than oh, yeah. they did <laughs> flight F-15s. So you know, we did that for a couple of weeks and ended up home. So, but it just goes to show how dynamic, right? And sure. adaptive the, the Navy could be, so. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And then, so I, I went back to Oceana. I was never planning on doing a career. Um, I, I was going to do a short tour and my goal is I wanted to get in the FBI. I wanted to, you know, my dream job would have been, you know, being a SWAT guy or, you know, with the FBI. And anyways, it so happens I was at the NAS Oceana gym and Matt, you had earlier asked about an alien you knew in Germany and who had been in the Navy. Uh, I just remember his call sign Duker, uh, Kevin Martin. That was his last name. Yeah, that's right, Martin. And, yeah, yeah, Kevin, Mar Kevin Martin. Yeah, he was a good guy. I'd, I'd known him from Pensacola and uh, you know Oceana. Uh, and so I said, hey, what are you doing? Because at the time the Navy was downsizing, right? The Tomcat was gonna go away. And uh, if you had a USNR, like a reserve commission, you a lot of those guys were getting ripped. And he said, well, I'm going to the Air Force. I'm gonna go to the F-15E. And I said, wow, because I knew, I didn't know a lot about the Air Force, but I knew that was a modern what we, aircraft, what they call a glass cockpit, right? Yeah. The Tomcat, in some ways, I was, it was basically like a, 
a, a better version of the uh, F4, right? I mean, it was all analog steam gauges. <laughs> I mean, it was pretty archaic. I mean, it was a very cool aircraft, right? Yeah. yeah. But the striking, it's all glass cockpit and uh, everything's digital. Um, so I said, ah, that sounds pretty cool. And I remember Duker said, well, but first I have to be an ALO. And I'm like, well, what's that? He said, <laughs> well, it's working with the Army. It's like a ground fact. And I'm like, that sounds really cool yeah. because again, you know, I'd always had like an interest in the ground uh, combat kind of a you know, scheme of maneuver. And uh, so I, I kind of looked into it. And since I was able to get out within a, a year or two, so I, I just put in a package. I had to go through my detailer, a package went to actually second nav kind of signed off on it and um, kind of coordinated with the air force. And so, but I said, I want to, I said, what are the different ALO jobs? And they said, Fort Benning. Uh, and I, uh, when I was looking at Fort Ben, Hey, there's a Ranger battalion there. They said, well, if you want that, <laughs> you got it. So <laughs> I was basically able to, um, kind of work my orders there. Uh, pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, funny story. So, you know, my wife and I, we were, we live large in Virginia beach, right? You know, we were there seven years. So we <laughs> had a lot of fun. Let's just say yeah. New Year's Eve party. And we had a big suite. A lot of our friends are there. So, uh, my wife, she swore me in to the Air Force uh, at midnight, <laughs> December 31st, nice. uh, yeah, 1996. <laughs> so anyway, so I think January 1st, of course, that was a holiday. So on January 2nd, I remember uh, I called Langley. So I had to go up and get an ID card. And I had no idea. I didn't, you know, what, what kind of uniform. And I remember I called the, you know, the, the personnel. So I said, what do I wear? And they said, we don't care. Can I wear civilian clothes? Sure. <laughs> so my first ID with the Air Force, and at the time my hair was pretty long. Yeah. And I like to push it when I was in the Navy. So uh, I'm, I'm in civilian clothes. Yeah, so yeah. it was very interesting later when, you know, my then down at Fort Benning, of course, remember for jumps, you know, it was look at your ID. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Say, who are you? <laughs> you look like some undercover AFO guy. Or... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it was fun. But that, that was my kind of transition. So then uh, the first school was, you know, JFC, right, or Hurlburt fascinated because it was joint. In fact, I kind of ended up with a social group. We'd hang out, work out, hang out. Uh, met a really cool pilot from the 160th, a couple SEAL team guys, uh, a Ranger FO from uh, First Bat. And anyways, just kind of hung out. And, but it was a very joint environment. And, uh, you know, I, like I said, it's, I, I really enjoyed that. And then I had to go to jump school. And then basically your third battalion at the time. So my wife, she was active duty. She was at NAS Jacksonville. And I lived basically it was kind of like bachelor officer quarters, um, essentially in Benning, and uh, started my yeah the the, the uh, yeah, couple year tour, and it was, it was quite a cultural shock, right? So <laughs> yeah, I've, and if you remember the, the the Rangers back then, very different from the post nine eleven. I mean, oh, it was yeah. the old school, um, you know, high and tight haircuts, spit shine boots, and and the the the, ra the Rangers. I remember the the first day there, um, I got introduced all. Uh, yeah, you know, to all the ranger officers and you know, I was getting a, a lot of stink eye a little <laughs> bit. But you know, they're they were good. In fact, we had a social function at the officers club too. But one of the first NCOs I remember meeting was uh, Sergeant Matt Eversman. Yeah. He was the S three NC uh air NCO. Mm -hmm. Real nice and humble and welcoming and now the Rangers they were good guys. In fact, uh I ended up make, becoming really good friends with a lot of them. Yeah. And, and I think that's, that's one thing I've learned, as you guys know, everything's about relationships, right? Sure. It, it, it is. And especially as an ALO, I mean, it's that liaison, right? So that, you have to establish a bond and, you know, that, that tight relationship. And, and a lot of it happens, you know, socially, right? Or right. if you're, you're working out with them, you're partying or, you know, having a beer with someone later on. So. Well, that's, that's so one that, thing about you important. is that like, uh, and with the Rangers and Matt can attest to this, if you're in shape, you're in, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that was one thing about you. You were always in really good shape. You would like to work out. And I think they took to that and they saw you, you know, cause we've had, we've had a few ALOs that didn't quite, you know, get <laughs> up to that standard, and, you know, and they kind of looked down on them a little bit, but I think that was that initial, you know, yep. like, a thing that they saw you was pretty good, but yeah. Thanks. Well, I will say, yeah, I've seen a lot of out of shape ALOs. Seen a few tech P. Oh yeah, 17. no, 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 no doubt. And, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, and and I have to admit though, my first impression when I when I first got there, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I was a little disappointed. Uh, oh. 
of course, this, this is the day before, you know, uh, the screening. And uh, so 17th, we had the detachment at, at Hunter. Mm -hmm. I got to know some of those guys, you know, super squared away from it. You remember Dennis Hay? Sure. Su super stud. I mean, I love his, his story and uh, Lundquist. Right, right. Uh, I remember those guys. But we were kind of in the infancy, right? And it, it seemed like just my perception, tact P, a lot of it was timing. If you happen to be in a unit, uh, yeah, that was assigned to support, you know, like a you know, soft unit, you know, you, you were there, you, you got the job. And so, in fact, it, what I remember, J.D., you were the first attack P that we actually recruited or you sent off station. Right, right. Remember, and then we had Quisenberry came from Hawaii. I mean, but I'm yeah. saying, but by the time we, I left, just within that short two-year period, I mean, we were, you know, full up. And I remember Jazz Erickson, when he showed up, that really started it. I mean, sure, for sure. It, 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 and Jazz was a stud, you know, he had uh, combat oh, yeah. experience with, um, third bat mm -hmm. i forget which ranger battalion he, yeah, was, he was with but he I jumped mean, into into panama with third bat yeah with, with with third bat yeah so uh obviously he had a lot of credibility and then we had guys who really were motivated really wanted to be there mm -hmm. right yeah. and so and, and jess was phenomenal you know, we made a really good team oh, yeah. and, and what i loved about that job i would say is that we, we kind of had roles but we were tight knit you know we'd work out together we were in the field together we kind of had our niche, right? You know, my job was, you know, a lot uh, the integration with the staff and the leadership to jazz. I mean, you, that, that's the thing in TAC P you guys are like fire and fire and forget, you know, <laughs> right. a AMRAM or a Phoenix missile, you know, it was so <laughs> professional squared away. Um, it made things easy for me, but what I loved is that cohesiveness that, that we had, right. Yeah. Remember we spent a month in Panama and all the little, you know, oh, TDY right. yeah, trips. Yeah. And, and what I loved about that, especially the men, you know, the 17th, Everyone's so professional. Like we could go out socially, but and still have fun. But it, where, like when I was in the Navy, it, it wasn't done. Right, right, right. And even my the rest of my time in the Air Force, things were more separate. Right, with you know the upside maintenance. And so, in fact, you guys were the ones, you know, the TAC people who you know trained me up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, really, you guys were the subject matter experts. Uh, in fact, back in the day, I remember uh, the JTAC call didn't exist. You guys were ETACs. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I remember, but I got my you know terminal attack control and. Um, in fact, if I recall, JD, we were in Camp Landing, and uh, we were—I forget one of the regular Ranger exercises—we were able to work in a ton of casts, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had—it was almost like an air show. In fact, at the uh, farewell, the battalion commander teased me about setting up my own private air show, and I, you guys called me a cast hog, and tied oh, yeah. me up, <laughs> taped me up. Oh, that's right, we taped you to that pillar in the in the barracks. That's gave, right. Gave me a little hazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I worked out. I was on the radio too much. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah but we had a lot of fun. Uh, I remember that, but it was, a, but again, those were peacetime days and, you know, the, and it was interesting to hear the stories of the guys who, uh, you know, it was third bat who had, uh, what is B company in Somalia. And mm. there are a few guys who had jumped into, uh, you know, Panama, and I think even fewer uh, who had jumped into Granada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and it was just a standard short cycle, right? right? Remember we had the pagers and, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. And remember, all of our gear was a standard CIF. Right, right. Issued. I think we, we had the M4s. Uh, I forget what kind of nods. but and, and the one thing, the Rangers back then, I mean, super squared away, but they reminded me of just skinny squared away Marines, you know? <laughs> but, you know, but again, the strength, I think, were, were the NCOs, right? And yeah. of course, all the officers were all hardcore type A plus personalities. Um, in fact, we had a, a joke that, uh, so in the staff, there's kind of like a hierarchy. You had all the infantry officers, right? The yeah. Infantry MOSs that we call them. They were the carnivores, <laughs> and then we had the herbivores. It was like uh, myself, the uh, you know the, the surgeon, the FSO, the comms, <laughs> the, <laughs> the chemo. We we were the yeah the, <laughs> the plant eaters, <laughs> right? You know, that, that was kind of the joke, but uh, but you know it was a fun. It was it was a great tour. Um, you know, I just you know super rewarding it was great to see just you know the i would say even the evolution you know 17th at least uh, supporting you know uh third battalion yeah I, mean, oh, I, was, I was gonna add you know one thing I, I think is kind of interesting too is you know your dynamic back then the fact that mm -hmm. the 17th was a mixed unit for life yeah oh right that's um, right you know and i mean I, i'm assuming it was valentini was probably your commander around oh there. yeah yeah <laughs> I, i'm just I, I mean i'm curious i mean i knew you guys yep. i knew all you guys back then i was up at bragg uh, coming mm -hmm. down there but i mean like what was the what was the relationship like being that that little section of a conventional unit that's you know kind of doing their own thing 
Yeah. So we had, I think, remember the 17th was out at Harmony Church. Harmony Church. Yeah. Or, or, yeah, yeah. Har- Harmony Church. Um, for the most part, so we all worked out of the HHC battalion. So we were, you know, fully integrated. I mean, occasionally we would go to, uh, the, I guess, the you know, 17th, the headquarters, but we didn't do a lot there. They were, uh, you know, of course, they had a flight that was supporting uh, with Third Brigade on mm-hmm. Kelly Hill. Um, we kind of kept to ourselves. Uh, we, we had a smaller debt with, um, you know, the regimental guys. Remember we had a, one gunship guy, Nick Sully. Right. Right. Remember him. Yeah. I, I remember Klukas. I met him. Klukas was a stud. He was, oh, yeah. you know, he was only there for a few months and then he left and I ran at him later. He was like a command chief uh, in Europe. Right. But he, he was considered like the apex, the, the epitome of oh, you know, sure. attack feet. <laughs> yeah. The Rangers will uh, talk about him. Yeah, I think he outrangered the Rangers. Sure. Uh, but I remember uh, Paul Ford, uh, Andy Cornelius, yep, yep. Uh, studs, and I think they we had just started kind of informally supporting RD. Uh, but I don't know if it. Had... I think they supported them at first. I think Paul and Andy had supported them, and then for some reason yeah. they didn't for a little bit, and then uh, I think we got back into it. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. And then Bruce Voigt came in. Was he? He was after Marty, right. wasn't he? I thought. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, br- yeah. Bruce was squared away, so. Pretty much, um, we dealt with just our little, you know, detachment. Th- uh, gosh, I'm trying to even think what we were called. I think we were B flight, but then you know, we just they're about you know, we had PT. We just were together almost all the time. We'd do some things with the the regimental folks. Um, and then uh, fast forward, and then so real quick, so then I ended up uh, going through um, Seymour Johnson nine months, get kind of uh, called F fifteen. I was in a uh, RAF Lake and Heath. Fun, fun tour nice. uh, there, a cu- couple of deployments. As, as you know, in fact, Matt, when I was listening to you and Brandy talk your podcast, you mentioned it's so true, time, right? In the military, timing's everything. You know, who gets the right missions? In the 90s, uh, Lake Anith was a place to be. Early 2000s, it was everything. We really weren't in the right place. So, for example, when 9-11 kicked off, right, uh, it was pretty intense. Uh in fact, my wife was drilling with the Navy Reserves in London, but we thought we were going to go to war. And, and no, because we also had the nuclear or the TAC nuke uh, mission. So we kind of had to stay in theater. So uh, I think, you know, Strike Eagles from Seymour Johnson or Mountain Home, they ended up going out, you know, for o, uh, you know, OEF, right. you know, the, the early push. And, you know, we kind of missed out. We we did a Southern Watch out of uh, Kuwait um, and then a Northern Watch out of Insulik. Did either of you guys go to Insulik? Uh, yeah, I've been there, but not for like anything, just an exercise, just, you know. Well, and, and, man, yeah. you know, it, it's it's a vacation. It's just a party. Spot. Oh, yeah, it's great. That, that, that's probably the most fun I've had. <laughs> <laughs> real, real quick, just one one quick story about it. In, Interlink, too. So we were doing uh, O&W, just kind of like DCA, Northern Iraq, super benign and boring. And, you know, weekends, I had my own BOQ room. Weekends were traveling. We had the alley where all we do is work out, party, play sports. <laughs> we were only flying a couple of missions because the Turks would cancel a lot of the missions. So uh, so we, we had this one weekend. A bunch of us did this trip, Cappadocia, the cool underground churches in, in, in Turkey. We get uh, the next day, I guess they call, I forget the term that we called it, where there was no, no flights the next day. So we were getting ready to do a big barbecue. We had an A-10 squad and doing CSAR. We had a couple of professional musicians by chance at Tampa Bay Buccaneer cheerleaders were there doing a USO <laughs> tour. So we were getting this big uh, party going. And uh, at the time, I think I had a, a, a 375 sweatshirt, right? And uh, one of the guys, my squadron had invited, he was an army warrant to, he was on his way home, but we did, he didn't know anything about his background. So he invited him, hey, why don't you come have a beer with us? So he's at the bonfires. He's my sweatshirt. Says, "Hey, that's pretty cool. I used to be a. I was, uh, you know, prior enlisted with one seven five. It turns out he had been the air mission commander. I think on one of the Chinooks for Anaconda. They got shot down. Oh, really? And he was on his way back to Conus. He was going to testify and back brief. Uh, you know, SOCOM, CENTCOM, but." It was amazing, but he was like the most, you know, humble man. Yeah. And I'm thinking, like, no kid, here we are. We're just partying, right? <laughs> <laughs> Drinking beer, hanging with cheerleaders. And he was like, no kidding, you know. We had all heard of, you know, knew what happened at yeah. Anaconda. And he was right in the middle of the thick of it. And so yeah. we were just mesmerized by his story. But it was just amazing, the contrast. Yeah. 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 That was a weird dynamic. I'll, if I could jump in real quick. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So we, my team, when I was, you know, two, when I deployed earlier, too, and was over there, they were doing R&R rotations because everybody was doing close to a year in theater. Mm-hmm. And I, I, think, I think SF at that time was doing like eight to nine months. And uh, they were, yeah. I was, I thought Bruce Voigt was actually over there as our NCOIC. 
And uh, my team sergeant's like, hey, you're going to, uh, you're going to go on r and I was like, no, mm-hmm. man, I can't. Like, I'm, yeah. I'm the only JTAC here. He's like, uh-huh. it's non-negotiable. I'm like, well, mm-hmm. I, you can't, no, don't take this wrong with it. You can't make that decision. Call my boss and if he's cool with it. <laughs> so, yeah, so Ricky Breton, our team sergeant, calls Bruce and he goes, hey, I'm sending Schleich on R&R. And Boyd's like, all right, cool, whatever, man. I mean, we, we were in such a benign area up in yeah. Bombay, and there was nothing really going on. But uh, I do remember going. I mean, I had a, you know, at that time I had a full beard. I hadn't cut my hair in like seven months. And I remember landing in Enserlik with some of my team guys. And just like you said, you get there and it's party and clubs and <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, just having a great time. And it was such an odd, you know, transition. Of one mm-hmm. minute you're, you know, in the middle of nowhere, Afghanistan with no electricity. And, and you know, eating T's and E's the whole time. And the next thing I'm in intro, like, you know, like, well, this is great on the beach hanging out. So, yeah. it was, it That's was right. Funny you that. Yeah. 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 So, so now what were you, um, were you in Hawaii when you, uh, I was, that, yeah. okay. my first, my first deployment was out of Hawaii. Yeah. I had forgotten. So yeah, it's amazing. I, I um, there's a book that about some of the, uh, first tag P there in OEF. I mean, that was amazing. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah, it's pretty much a pickup on. game for a lot of guys. I mean, they yeah. in like you said, the right place, right time, and yeah, I mean those guys. That that initial push that 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 side did was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. God, it was so amazing. I yeah. mean, I think I was on the second. I guess what you would call the second wave of guys because they sent okay. everybody over. They sent everybody over in October. Yeah, we right after you know, obviously the Rangers went over there, jumped in. Um, mm-hmm. All the SF units, you know, came in out of K two, oh, uh, right, right, and then then they decided. That, I don't know why they decided it. Um, but then they said mm-hmm. they had to have a mini selection for guys <laughs> yeah, to go right. over there because I guess oh. some guys had, had some hard, had some trouble staying up with the teams. And yeah. the mm-hmm. um, so they brought us all to Fort Bragg. I don't know if you were there or not, JD, but they brought everybody no, to Fort have... Bragg. They asked for volunteers. We went to Bragg, you know, did that, and then I ended up leaving in uh, I want to say March of O two. Okay. So yeah, I anyway, forgot how was... many soft you depl- uh, deployments you had done. Oh yeah, he was back. You back. were doing. You did a bunch, didn't you? I mean, uh, how many... I did eight. Yeah. Well, yeah. Eight total. And the thing about and, it is, and, like, you talk about ranger deployments versus soft deployments. I talk about on this thing all the time. But eight yeah. soft deployments, that could be, I mean, that's a, six months, eight months. I mean, it's not its not a short mm-hmm. time for a mm-hmm. soft deployment. I mean, that's, that's yeah, a Yeah, there were seven months. The two I did were seven months. I was that's there a little longer than two. But yeah. most of them, though, were the, the standard 90 to 120 days. Oh, okay. okay. I, I will say, Matt, you had some pretty cool pictures. You're looking fairly rock star. <laughs> during your He's got the best pictures. <laughs> you, you do. <laughs> they now, were JD, all staged. <laughs> now, JD, were you still at the 17th? Because you never. Or yeah, I stayed there leave? for when you left. And then I okay. stayed there the whole time when you came back. Yeah, I was there from 97 okay. to about uh, 20, 20. When did I go? Two, 2009, I guess. I went to. Um, alaska after that so yeah that's right that's a yeah. long stretch yeah well i mean they kept like they just kept asking me to do different stuff like it was like you know i was at battalion first and then they asked me to go to rd and then they asked me to uh you know be the op soup so it, it was just and like like we always say right place right time i just happened to fall into those certain circumstances that they just kept recoding me and i ended up being able to stay which was great it was the best thing that could ever happen and uh yeah I, yeah it was it was great i had a good time but yeah when you came back that was a. Uh, it was crazy because that that I that's unheard of. I'd never heard of a in ALO doing that. You know, like being being a captain, and they come back as a lieutenant colonel. So yeah, that was a so two thousand seven, uh, and, and the reason that happened. Uh, so after uh, so it was at Lake and Heath. I was able to get a staff job. Actually, for a while, I had orders to go back to the seventeenth. Nice. Um, and it was to be the DO, but then whoever the commander was said, well, I got somebody else to be a DO. And then my detailer said, we're not going to send you back. You've already done that. Yeah. Um, so then I was kind of looking for a staff job. I got the one position. I was actually LA Air Force Base. So <laughs> Space Command, it was a rated position. I will say probably the best three years just from a personal point of view as far as you know, a lot of surfing, season passes, Disneyland, you <laughs> right. know, snowboarding. Yeah. But you want to talk about being, you know, the tip of the spear. We were like at the base of the handle. <laughs> so, right. you know, I was dealing with acquisition and engineers and, you know, I had a, a team. It was, yeah, I mean, I did a lot of PowerPoint briefings, but I will say, but I did have a, one uh, cool deployment. I went to Afghanistan and uh, I was actually out of Kabul, CFC Alpha, kind of the overall coalition, you know, headquarters. And I was a narcot- uh, the counter narcotics planner. Nice. And again, just... Uh, cool position. So, but I was working not only with, uh, you know, NATO, ISAF, but the Afghan Ministry of Interior, the State Department, UN, 
uh, D E A I N L. And back then we lived in drug Lord houses in Kabul. We'd have these <laughs> Afghanis would take us in a taxi to you know, where we worked. I had a truck. I remember one time driving through chicken street. We had a lot of free reign <laughs> back then. And, uh, just, I remember traveled everywhere. And so you'd, um, I mean, it, it was, but it was fascinating being in that not only joint, but international coalition environment. In fact, my boss, he was a, a, a British colonel, right? And oh, so okay. we also had a French uh, major. He he was our party planner. So he would take show us, take us to all the cool parties in, in ISAF or you know, some of the State Department. <laughs> you know, I'm really fun. noticing a trend yeah, in all of your assignments. <laughs> There's a lot of partying going on. <laughs> it's important. You got to blow off steam. Yeah. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and I, I ended up running uh, the MI-17s that you guys had. Uh-huh. That actually ended up becoming really? the programs I ran in Afghanistan after I retired. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, all the MI-17s and PC-12s. Yep. Wow. I'd like to think we made Afghanistan better, but... <laughs> it was good for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but that was uh, yeah, kind of a pretty fun, rewarding tour. So anyway, so I uh, had to be back at Seymour Johnson. And uh, anyway, so I'd heard uh, Nick Sully. So we'd kind of kept in touch. And I, he invited me down to visit. He was uh, down at Fort Bragg. I think he was a DO, um, the 18th, I yep. believe. Or, oh, was it? Yeah, okay. The, mm-hmm. Yeah, the 18th. And so I had met, and with, so it was a, actually, it was a change of command. And so, but I had met the, the DO before me, uh, JD, if I forget his name. He had been a prior enlisted ranger. I think he was a, a helicopter pilot. Oh, Moncrief. Moncrief, yeah, yeah Moncrief, Moncrief, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, but but Moncrief was uh, apparently leaving. I'm like, uh, and I, wow, that would be really cool to go back. So I just kind of threw my hat in the ring. Um, I interviewed with the ASOG commander, and I remember at the interview he said, so just confirm you're a, a volunteer for any DO position. And I said, no, I'm a volunteer for the 17th. Because <laughs> right. I, I had a pretty good thing going at Seymour Johnson. Uh, you know, we are very comfortable, and I was – uh, actually, I had a side gig. I was an advanced agent with Air Force One, so that was kind of cool. I got to do a few of those trips. and nice. So I'm like, I could just wait it out. I would go to the 17th, but I'm not going anywhere else. Sure. So, And anyway, so I was able to get orders. And uh, yeah, and it was great to see you, JD, right away. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and and that's where – and so Matt was there. So I was at the DO, and Matt was the ops NCO. And we basically got there at the same time. And it, it was it, – yeah, and to go to, to see the 17th, and you guys have been pushing hard for, what, five, six years, right? Oh, yeah. Constant deployments. And back then we had the SF uh, detachments and, I mean, constant state of churn. So it was – but again, you know, I mean, just super professional and, you know, amazing the stories. And I hate to say we almost took for granted what guys were doing. Yeah. Um, remember like Muley, you guys – I remember hearing about like his big uh, – incident you know like a 24-hour firefight yeah yeah big stack of aircraft and then you know like mad and jd hearing about your stories and it was just kind of hard to believe but it was just it, it was standard standard right 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 yeah, yeah. It, was. Well, it was it's crazy to think that it had become mm-hmm. routine but essentially it had You're right it, it, it yeah, and it, it was just amazing, but it was at that point, yeah, the 17th uh, was all, you know, kind of soft side. We're still technically under ACC, and I think it was later that year when we added uh, the guys out of Fort Lewis, right, the, you know, 275. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we had the guys at Bragg, and then, uh, yeah, the guys at Lewis, or basically all the guys that fell under the 18th came underneath, and then, yeah, the Lewis mm-hmm. guys were the last ones to move over. Yep, and I want to get your take, too, especially, if, Matt, because – it, at least at that time, the Air Force was doing it right on the uh, you know on the Ranger side, right? <clears throat> you know the Manning was up, and you know the guys were fully integrated into you know the battalions and their you know companies and the George cycle with the SF. And I remember you know I, I mean we had great tech P at the SF side, and you know my understanding they were basically set up back in the '90s kind of do more ECAS training, right? So they weren't technically aligned. Yeah, with, they, uh, they, with the group. Those positions were never, and you know, I'm sure there's somebody on here that could probably correct me. You know, a, a Mark Lutz or a Doug Tillman, uh-huh. but uh, Kenny Watterson. But those those positions were always set up to essentially provide ECAS training to mm-hmm. you know to the to the teams out there to whoever they could. Uh, and the guys that you had two units actually at Fort Campbell. One was mm-hmm. with Fifth Group, and the other one was with the 160th. The 160th guys. Mm-hmm. were essentially there to run the ranges. Mm, okay. um, so those positions, you know, they did go on deployments with them. Uh, they would go with them. But uh, but there was never any kind of formal agreement where those 
individuals stationed there were to supposed to provide direct support during mm-hmm. combat for contingency operations. Mm-hmm. That that kind of morphed itself. And I don't know if the you know the doc statement. I don't think it ever changed uh-huh. even the whole time through you know through OEF and OIF. The guys just kept deploying with them. Yeah. So. Which kind of speaks but, volumes yeah. about those kind of the kind of caliber of dudes that supported mm-hmm. those SF units. They were like. That was not, they could have very easily said, no, nope, we're just trainers. We can just hang out here. But they were such hard yeah. chargers. They're like, no, we're definitely going with these guys. And and then, yeah. and they weren't, they weren't manned appropriately. I mean, they had, I mean, uh-huh. like, geez, how many yeah. ODAs are out there? I mean, who knows? Yeah. But like, Jesus and there was Christ. like four or five guys supporting four a, guys, yeah. four guys supporting a, a special forces group. Yeah. Group. It's yeah. amazing. And weren't we down to like three per group a, a couple of times? Yeah, we we ran into some issues just keeping it for man. I mean, and you know the guys that were there, uh, they they had phenomenal relationships with certain elements. You know, it, it was yes. just you had such a they they had so many people to quote unquote support. Right. You know, trying to develop those relationships and mm-hmm. and, and they did a phenomenal job doing it just because they were you know, inserting themselves with with those teams and, and mm-hmm. with the leadership. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it it was difficult. I remember I think it was a uh, Campbell t- talking to one of the. Uh, army you know the battalion commanders and he expresses frustration not with the individuals you know, these are studs but that he there weren't enough sure, and there was yeah. no formal relationship like i can't even guarantee they're going to deploy with us right it, well we went from four to eight i remember that was okay. a big deal and i think that happened while we jd me and you were at the 17th yeah that we like doubled our numbers and then went on mm-hmm. a mass recruiting deal but even even eight i mean you know you're still yeah it, at that time they wanted us to man down to the oda and that was just impossible <laughs> yep. with the number of ODAs they were deploying. Uh, right. So that's when, you know, obviously, you know, CCT was directly involved. The SF were trying to create their own JTAGs and we were trying to provide as many yeah. full-time people. And then we kind of got away from the augment T thing after, I think, uh, I think 03, 04, we, we quit doing the augment T thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Emma, so are, are you enjoying being a man of leisure? <laughs> uh, I am. It's uh, it's not bad. I'm actually going back to work though. So. Oh, are you? What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'd rather, I'm doing some consulting now. I'll talk to you guys offline about it. Okay. Oh, no kidding. Cool. Yeah, last year was a big travel year. I took a, I quit working essentially January of last year. Okay. And, uh, we traveled a lot. We went to New Zealand, Tahiti, <clears throat> wow. Mexico three times. Okay, I saw that New Zealand uh, post you posted, man. That's amazing. How was that? Yeah. It's incredible. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, if you have not been to New Zealand, I highly, highly recommend it. That, that's a bucket list place. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it's it's incredible. We did, actually did New Year's there. So we're down in Queenstown. We're the first people to welcome the new year oh all right <laughs> yeah it's it's awesome. Awesome. let's get well you guys deserve it though but and also you were crushing it with mag right weren't you kind of senior leadership i was management yeah, i was and then uh yeah uh-huh. and then you know le- our leadership senior leadership changed my our c c-suite changed out and things got uh-huh. i just quit enjoying myself yeah so okay. it's time, to, time to do something different kinda that's like, kind of why you, got you, you, i was, was gonna say it's kind of like how you retired yeah <laughs> Hey man, it's you know if you're not having fun, what's the point? Exactly, I, I no, for sure, for yeah. sure. Yeah, but hey, JD, one thing I want to ask: so, what was the transformation? So, the seventeenth when you first got there, uh, back uh, you must have shown up like ninety eight, right? I believe it was like uh, October ninety seven, I think, when I got there. or ninety seven. Okay, yeah. ninety seven. Then through until through two thousand seven, uh, like yeah, it was like what was, well, it was exponential because like like you were talking about it, you we started off with just the CIF kit and the Rangers didn't really have, they, they had all the stand, like L, we're still wearing LBEs and like, you know, mm-hmm. ammo, you know, ammo pouches and two, one quart canteens and a two quart canteen on your ruck. And then it just, it, it grew because of out of the necessity, you know, we just tried to deploy with that kind of equipment, you know, the nods we had weren't, were substandard. I think we had PBS fives when we first got there and then they, I know it was crazy. <laughs> and then we got, I think we got the 14 eventually. And then, uh, you know, we, we ended up, I think we got the PVS 15, the dual tube before the Rangers mm-hmm. did. I, I don't think we okay. all, I think anybody yeah. had those. Um, but yeah, it was just, it was amazing that the, the, the change yeah. in like body armor and, you know, just equipment mm-hmm. and we kind of had to fight. I want to say, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. You came in, you were there, you were involved with this, but I, I think we had to fight to get the, the body armor that the Rangers were using. I think in that regard, they, they led the way on that. You know, they were, yeah, we, uh, that was, uh, you know, probably, that was, if you want to say the straw that broke the camel's back for hmm. us really wanting to leave ACC, yeah. um, that was that was it. Because we were sending guys, you know, you were supposed to be x-raying your body armor so often. Mm-hmm. Blah, blah, blah. 
and uh, the body armor that we were sending you guys down. We didn't even have enough of it. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. I was literally right, right. borrowing plates yep. from the 15th ASOS from the commission. Wow. <laughs> because ACC would not buy us body armor. Their yeah. whole thing is like, we'll get it from the Rangers. And it's like, well, that's not the right answer. Right. You know, um, especially at the rate we were deploying. So, mm-hmm. so I remember going to, I, I forgot who was running the 15th, whether it was Stockman or Corbett. And I'm like, hey, man, can I sign out plates and some body armor? And, and I, remember, I, I remember they were just looking at me like I was crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I remember that. And in fact, man, you just kind of brought up a good point, too. And I kind of remember even from my days, you know, late 90s at the 17th and then in 2007, still under ACC. But it seemed like the rest of the, I'd say, conventional tech beat community didn't like the 17th. That was kind of the perception. Maybe not too strong of a word. I think but- maybe the leadership, they had a feeling – and I don't know, this, uh, this is the, the feeling I got. It was like we were, they didn't like us because they thought we didn't like them or something. You know, mm-hmm. it was more like, because I don't think we had any ill will, especially towards the yeah. 15th. We were like, we were definitely in, ingrained with those guys. I mean, that we trained mm-hmm. we trained their dudes yeah. and we did stuff. But Matt, maybe you talk to that. If you guys, we, we just had some, you know, I don't want to say poor leadership, but some uh, uneducated leadership at ACC and at the Pentagon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, at the time, senior enlisted leadership. I'm not mm-hmm. even. I want to even blame it on the officers. Uh, it was the senior enlisted leadership that just, you know, still were in that. You know, we're we're evolving so fast during GWAT, and they're still in this mindset of, you know, the fold of gap and yeah, <laughs> right. you know, you you've got your relationship with the army. You should be getting all that stuff from the army. <laughs> Yeah, but man, we're not. It's, this isn't like a. I get body armor issued once, and it's good for ten years. Yep. Yeah, these yeah, guys yeah. are every you know every six months. These dudes are going down range, and you know, mm-hmm. and, and using this shit. Not to mention the training the guys are going through. So yeah. it, it was very. It, you know, maybe that was bad on you know my part and so, some of our part that we didn't educate those guys. There was always I forget. There was always a senior uh, you know E nine who the functional chief right. It, ACC was always kind of like the nation. It was always hard to work uh, personnel assignments. I remember uh, it, it was, it was not a big fan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah, it was frustrating because they they didn't. It was almost like they didn't believe us. Like we, they thought mm-hmm. we were trying to get over, which was kind of like. <clears throat> I mean, again, I love I love this career field, but that's kind of the way old school kind of guys thought. Like they never yeah. believed anything you said. They always because I mean, frankly, they were. It was justified because most people were trying to get over. They were trying to get extra stuff and trying to, you know, skate or whatever. But, you know, we weren't. We were actually like, no, we need these nods. We need this body armor. We need this. We need this uh, PEQ on our weapon. We No, mm-hmm. I couldn't. You know, it's amazing. You go out to the range with Rangers and they were like, oh, just shoot your laser down here. And it's like, what laser? What do you mean? And, you know, so <laughs> it's it, that's the kind of stuff that we were trying to convey. And since nobody else really had that kind of stuff and nobody had been exposed to it, they didn't. I guess, believe us or that we really needed it. Yeah. yeah, And and that was really where the, yeah, that was where, that was where the push to move to AFSOC really Mm -hmm. started kind of, we had talked about it and I'd had meetings with, uh, with jazz prior to when I was down at the seven twentieth here at Hurlburt, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd talked to jazz a few times, uh, general, or, uh, not Longoria, uh, LaMonica, chief LaMonica Mm -hmm. was down here. And I think it was Colonel Thompson was the group commander at the time, you know, and we just had some discussions and even, even their predecessors, uh, on, hey, what do you think about the soft tack P guys, the Rangers uh-huh. and soft tack P guys moving around AFSOC? And I said, I think it's, I think it'd be great. Yeah. You know, so you start having these conversations, and I'm like, so when I got to the 17th yep. and really uh-huh. saw kind of the, the problems, and what I was really amazed with was how much resistance I, I met with <laughs> from guys uh-huh. at the 17th that did not want to go under uh, AFSOC. Okay. And, and uh-huh. I had been there. I saw you know how much when I deployed in 2005. I saw how much AFSOC spent on me, yeah. one individual, mm. yep. probably forty thousand dollars worth of equipment yeah. for one deployment, and I was like, "We're crazy not to want to be a part of this." You know? Exactly. So, yeah. So that was well, that was kind of the, the genesis of it. Of that that final, I think the wheels were in motion, <laughs> but man, that just fighting for body armor for dudes to go down range was just absolutely foreign to me. Yeah. Yep, I remember that. Yeah, so in 2007, because I know, Matt, you had really paved the way. And I'd forgotten, you were actually with the 2-1 up at Pope, right? When, in like the first, yeah. yeah, the first TAC P had actually be. I don't know if you you weren't officially assigned, but you... No, no, no. They did a... Uh, so they did... It was uh, Colonel Longoria was the commander of the 2-1 at the okay. time. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. He was an 05. And then, um, and actually, it's kind of funny, because and Jeff Staha was the blue team leader. And I know mm-hmm. you've had him on here yeah, yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. So they did a uh, they did a trial program essentially, and it was kind of almost mirrored the SF thing. They they wanted to bring TACPs over from the 14th ASOS to essentially be help train 
their guys and be the fires guy on the special tactics teams. The two one had just become an STS. I think the year prior um, so special tactics squadron. So they, they volunteered. It was my, you know, myself, Todd McCabe, JJ Salisbury, and then uh, Gary Jones was actually kind of our, our E6 NCOIC. If you will, mm-hmm. he ran a fire shop yep. in the, uh, at the squadron. Uh, the rest of us were on teams and uh, it was supposed to be a year long program. It was all volunteer. And uh, I think Mignon was, Sean Mignon was supposed to go over there, and then he ended up going to Kosovo, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, so anyway, so we ended up with our guys, and, and and honestly, I'll tell you, that was probably we talk about timing and things that happened. That was probably so instrumental in my career because having a chance to work with those guys on a daily basis and kind of show them, hey, we all have misconceptions of what yep. each other do. You know, mm-hmm. we all think that combat controllers are a bunch of <laughs> staying in holiday inns wearing their yeah. little hats. <laughs> You know, <laughs> pre Madonnas, and they all think that these are a bunch of assholes that hate them. And I was like, so, so you, getting a chance to work together and go on trips with those guys and, and train with them, um, it, it, it opened everybody's eyes, which was awesome. Yeah. Which led yeah. me, you know, later on in my career when I, I left, I ended up leaving Bragg and I ended up going to Hawaii. I ended up coming back to the 720th. I knew those same guys. Mm-hmm. You know, Jeff Staha's replacement was Mike Martin. Mike Martin, he's now this, you know, the SOCOM J3. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I could just go down a list of names of guys that were captains and staff sergeants that became command chiefs. Oh mm-hmm. sixes, oh sevens, you know, Wolf Davis, uh, you know, R.A. Armfeld. I mean, these are all dudes that kind of passed through those doors. So anyway, right. yeah, one way to tell you that, yeah, yes, I was over there. You know, I don't know if I was necessarily the first. Yeah. The, two, the two four still had some fires guys up there, like Marty and, uh, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to think of who. Was it Andy Cornelius? I think he was there. Didn't he do a fire? He was there. He was there later. Yeah, he was there okay. later. There was one guy that really kicked the whole thing off for us up the two four, and then Jonesy at the two one. But yeah, mm-hmm. that was that was the the I guess the birth of it all, if you will. Yeah, yeah. it was right. And if I remember that, uh, so I think it was a. 2007, but anyways, when the AGA was created, right? The uh, Air Ground Operations Wing, they basically had all the TACP units consolidated and the, the, some special security forces team, but uh, but it was General Longoria who had yep. yeah. been combat controller. So he was the first commander. And yes. I remember he said, I love all berets. And he was a great, I think, unifying force. Oh, 100%. Because I, I remember sure. my first ALO tour, I know there was a little angst or I don't know, slight animosity with the you know controllers, TACP. <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, but I remember Matt, but when you showed up, because uh, again, yeah, you laid the groundwork for the integration into AVSOC. And I remember working a lot with uh, Major Chris Larkin, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a great guy down there and doing our trips. And, uh, and, and it was the right place as we know, because even in 2007, I remember even the equipment we had, you know, in some ways we looked like gypsies, you know, it was oh, yeah. <laughs> very standardized. I remember, you know, my kit it wasn't. And then, yeah, by but, yeah, then within a year, we're under SOCOM and I think MFP4, right? Then we're, no kidding, getting into the standardized, you know, kit. And, yeah, yeah. But Matt, you were the one, but like I said, I was telling JD earlier, you know, you the right man, the right time, the right place, you know, to, to make all that happen. It was with all of your personal, re, your relationships made really, no kidding, for a, such a smooth transition. Yeah. So, was, I mean, yeah, all, all the credit to you. Well, there's no credit. making that happen. <laughs> it was it was timing and luck. You know? <clears throat> I, I know JD probably knows my story. I, when I was at the 720th, I got orders to Korea, and uh, and I was a little I was a little upset, and uh, I'd already decided at that point. Well, screw it, because um, I was going to try and go to the 24 to be a fire guy up there. Uh-huh. That was kind of kind of my plan. I was like, all right, screw it. I'll go to the I'll go to Korea. I'll you know put my package in from there, and I'll come back. And and then a uh, Quisenberry actually called me. I think it was like 2000 2000. Yeah, it was 2005 because Q called me up. I was deployed and mm-hmm. uh, and he offered me a job at the 17th. I was like, well, I don't know, man. I'm not, I'm, I, I got my plan. This is what I'm going to do. And he's <laughs> yep. like, well, you know, and I was like, and plus Monica, you know, I got Monica with me. I'm like, yep. I, I got to bring her. So Q goes, well, well, he goes, I'm like, what would I do there? He goes, well, <laughs> I want to put you in RRC. And I was like, I don't even know what the hell, I don't really know what RRC is. <laughs> right, you know? yeah. So he gives me a little bit of a, an explanation of it. I was like, oh, okay, well, you know what? That sounds kind of cool. But once again, Monica's the the winch. Where mm-hmm. is she going to go? You know, and if, for people on the podcast who don't know, my wife was active duty military. Um, she had gone to jump school when she was at uh, Pope Air Force Base with us, the 14th mm-hmm. Day Assault. And, um, and she was sitting down here at, Af- at AFSOC with me working the intelligence <coughs> water, which she mm-hmm. hated. And Q's like, well, let me talk to, uh, oh man, what was his name that was over at Jump School Forever? Uh, Entrobius. Oh, so yeah, let me that's talk right. to Marcus. 
And yeah, and then we got or we got Monica orders for Benning as a mm-hmm. black hat, and then wow. I got and then I got orders. You know, Q was able to get my orders to Korea canceled, pulled me up to the seventeenth, and the whole time I'm overseas. And I remember I went <laughs> from going to RC and being really excited to, oh hey dude, sorry man, um, you got promoted, yeah. so now you're gonna go, you're gonna end up being the uh, the B flight NCIC with three seven five, and I was like, eh, okay, well not, you know, not as, not as attractive, but okay, I'll do it. that's cool. And then Q gets orders and, and it goes, Oh, by the way, and the next phone call is you're going to be the ops suit. And I was like, Son of a, I was like, that's man, not what you guys offered me. Yeah. I would have never volunteered for this man. <laughs> be the ops suit. I, was like, I, still got, I got some fight left in me, man. I don't want to yeah. be you know, in that position. So anyway, yeah. Yeah, you know what been. though, in, in a testament to you though, like you knew you were, you had an SF background essentially. And I think mm-hmm. we talked about this on the first one, but I want to reiterate it yeah. because I think it's really important. You, coming into the Rangers, you didn't just like come in and, you know, act like you owned the place and right. thought you knew everything. You went on a deployment. I think it was the first bat. Didn't you go on a, like a 90 day or 120 day deployment? Where I you did. did. Yeah. It was yeah, over a hundred well, missions. I mean, you did. Yeah. You were, well, you were yeah, job. Was short. They were short guys and, <clears> and <throat> asked, you know, hit me up and asked me if I'd be interested in going deploying with OLA and yeah. first battalion. I was like, yeah, man, sounds fun. So it was great. <laughs> yeah. I got to deploy with those guys in 2008 with a platoon. And we were, yeah, we were up in Mosul and pretty busy. Bobby Pena was actually in our sister platoon over there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, so me and him were running and gunning the whole time. It was it was a lot of fun. It's yeah, that's it's probably the most fun I've had on a deployment. Mm-hmm. You know, we're and you know, deployments like, you know, an SF deployment is you're going out, you're engaging, you're coming back, you're drinking beer and hanging out and having a good time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Rangers, it was like, you're, it's just fight, 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 you know, yeah. the entire time, which, which I loved. And, mm-hmm. and I, I love both missions, but that was probably the most fun I ever had on the point. But just being around, you know, mm-hmm. I was 30, let's see, 2000, I was 36. And I'm probably, I think I was the oldest guy in the platoon. And I was mm-hmm. an E8. So I was like, you know, the next to the first, or the <laughs> highest ranking guy in the platoon. Right. <laughs> next yeah. to the PL. So, yeah, so it was, it was pretty fun. It was, it was, like I said, being around all those young dudes and how mm-hmm. motivated they were and how good, you know, just how good the Rangers were and are. Mm-hmm. Was, uh, yeah, that was, that was a blast. It was pretty unheard of. I mean, like like you said, it wasn't like you just went over there to yeah. do an advisor role or sat in the mm-hmm. talk. I mean, you were like a, you know, company JTAC it is, as an E8, as, you know, I mean, it was, that was, that was very commendable that you did that. It was so, I thought that was so awesome. It, it was great. I was very fortunate for the opportunity and very thankful. So yeah, I got to meet some great people that, that I still talk, talk to people about. So. You, I remember uh, you really bonded with them and they wanted you to come back to Ranger Prom. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Yeah. That. yeah. That was funny, but uh, yeah, but the Rangers had, had evolved in just one quick, uh, you know, just an observation. So uh, I replaced Belk. So at the senior yep. level, you know, 17th, we would do a fires desk and, uh, Bell, he had uh, he was at TF seventeen, and so I replaced him as a J three fires. But I remember at the time we had uh, it was at a you know buy up. Uh, we had the two seven five folks were kind of operating there, and I remember after one mission, um, it's hard to remember which one of our J our J tax, but I saw him after a mission was early morning, and just the swagger, you know, the, the kit <laughs> and. You, you know, of course, you know, the Rangers, they had, you know, now they were growing their hair out a little bit, but they looked like operators. And, and it was a complete 180 from back in the late 90s. And yeah. again, they looked like skinny, squared away Marines <laughs> now. And, you know, and then Rangers were doing their own missions. And I mean, what I'm saying is and this was 2007, but wow, they've really evolved and they, they just keep evolving. You know, now when I see commercials, recruiting commercials for the Rangers or their tack piece, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, pr- pretty, pretty impressive. So, but just visually, visually for me, it was, a, it was quite a transformation. Right. Right. Yeah. They, it was kind of like out of necessity, you know, I mean, they had to step up. There were so many missions yep. because if you think about it, you know, we talk about Panama and Grenada and we talk about mm-hmm. uh, Somalia, you know, those are, in, those are isolated incidences, essentially, you know, maybe a couple of days here, a couple of days there, even desert storm, hundred hours. But this mm-hmm. was like 10, 15, 20 years of the kind of missions Matt was going on, like a hundred mission, hundred plus missions per deployment. Yep. So like the, the lessons being learned were just, you know, exponentially more than anything else we'd ever experienced. So yeah, they, mm-hmm. they just became these yep. supermen as, you know, as the, as the GWAT went on. Yeah. It was yeah. Awesome. And, and I would say that was, a, that was mm-hmm. a ta- the task force as a whole. I'll, mm-hmm. yeah, for know, sure. I, I, I remember just, I, I think, I, I don't know if I talked about this last time or not, but I'll never forget when, you know, you're, you're there and you get notified of a mission, you walk into the, 
you walk into the dock, yep. you get your products, you go, mm-hmm. over, you, you know, you brief. And as you're stepping to the strikers, you know, at that time, mm-hmm. you know, all your assets are moving. Like right. they're, they're all coming to support this mission. So they're, as I'm walking, I'm checking in with the 58 D's and, you know, a U 28 yep. gunship mm-hmm. or, or whatever supporting me there. You know, one of the contractor aircraft, Greyhound or dare. And, it, and it's just, I mean, it was so fluid and we were so honed as a unit. And this was every Ranger platoon, every CAG troop, every, you know, mm-hmm. I, I can't speak to the SEALs, but I'm sure they were the same way. But yep. I, I mean, at that time, I th- I would say by 2008, I mean, it really started in 2004, 2005, mm-hmm. when guys really started ramping up. By 2008, 2009, I, I, there was no one in the world that I think could have yes. defeated a Ranger platoon. Oh, I, 100%. I, it was just, it was insane just how fluid everything was. Go out, yeah. do a hit, you know, mm-hmm. jack, you know, touchdown, jackpot, bump, yep. roll back and just wash, rinse, repeat, you know, sometimes right. four mm-hmm. times a, four times a night sometimes, you know. Yeah. Just, sometimes you didn't even it. come back. Sometimes you went from that target and it wasn't even, <laughs> oh, yeah. it was like a new target that you had to go from that yeah. the other one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're, dro- you know, like I said, 58s are dropping your products on the top of a roof, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, it's just, it was just, it was awesome, man. That's what I said. Yeah. It was, uh, it, it was amazing to see. And, but also I can only imagine how fleeting, you know, that experience is and that, mm-hmm. uh, that continuity. Cause I don't know, man, it took us a long time to get there, but. And I don't, yeah. who, know, who knows where they're at now? So. Yeah, right. I, I know. We, we've we lost a lot. Like I said, you know, we took it for granted. So, in fact, I misspoke when I said 2007 is 2008, but that was the height of the surge. Right. Mm-hmm. Remember? So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah Petraeus, Petraeus, I think, uh, was in charge. And I remember we were doing a lot of work like Solder City. Um, and But we just took it for granted. And remember, the 17th, we were deployed. We, Our guys were... Opcon, I mean, spread out platoon level between Iraq and Afghanistan. Then we had the FSF side. So, yeah, yeah. It, it was yeah. so interesting. Where a normal tech, you know, a conventional tech P, you're still part of a like a you know a larger squadron, and you, know, well, you have a deployed ASOG. And, ASOG. Right. and our SF guys, you know, we, we were obviously talking a lot of Ranger centric, but you know, by that point, especially in Iraq, mm-hmm. those guys were running with SIF teams at that right. point. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. you know, so I mean, so they're out there. It, it, hitting a fight just like just like the rangers are doing these you know high hvt targets and and just you know getting in gunfights all the time you know scott mcphee ed shulman all them dudes you know yeah laying on mini guns and just <laughs> yeah laying right. waste and stuff. so it's That's right know, yeah those guys were just as busy and they'd elevated themselves to where like i said you know they sometimes they did sift deployments but not but then it was like every time a sift went out they had mm-hmm. you know i, I think they're crfs now or whatever they call them but uh yeah yeah, yeah but now, yeah it, it was it was incredible to see the entire unit both sides just i mean just keep getting better and better and better yeah uh, mm-hmm. throughout that time mm-hmm. and from what i understand they're even even better now like they're they're head and shoulders oh, yeah. above where even we were it's just yeah. it's, it's great to see i, I love it and and like kind of I was talking to Chachi recently and he was saying the same thing. Like if you set the stage and you, you prepare these guys, that's the way it should be. You know, the, the guys coming from behind you should be equal. I think you said it too, Matt, on that first podcast, they should be as equal or better than us. And that's the goal mm-hmm. is to make them better than us and make the 100%. unit better. Yeah. If they're not, you're failing. So Right, right. Yeah. yeah. And I think a big part of that evolution. So remember, so 2008, uh, I know we chopped over to AFSOC and remember we did that cool ceremony down in Hurlburt. But I think that year we started doing assessment selection, uh, not only for TACP and ALOs and Matt and I remember we spent a lot of time in Hurlburt running those. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty squared away. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, CK, you were obviously the commander at that point, you know, when we went over to AFSOC. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know when we, I remember sitting down with, with LA down here at 720th, I, you were probably there too. And we kind of started. I, and you know, JD, yeah. I think I've told you this. I actually have my green book where I yeah. put out where the whole the whole structure. I still got it here. Mm-hmm. It has the entire structure of what I thought the 17 should look like, mm-hmm. and um, and even breaking guys off to the STSs. And we had 15 positions. I mean, initially they gave us the world. Mm-hmm. They were converting yeah. yep. Charlie two combat control positions over or whatever mm-hmm. one, one Zulus now. And um, yeah, I mean, and, and then then we ran into the problem that we get we basically got everything we asked for. And I remember LA going like, all right, man, you know, but here you go. Yeah. Kill them. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we run the first assessment and like four dudes show up. And I was like, oh God, <laughs> <laughs> what just happened? I know. <laughs> we were still fighting ACC, not letting guys come to the selections because obviously you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. That's right. But, right. but at the same time, man, you, you were really, how many guys did you lose because you didn't allow them that opportunity that got out? You know, mm-hmm. like, right. Screw it. You know, 
Like, why not just let him do it? You know, like, like, I never understood that holding the guy back. Uh -huh. And then, Matt, you also created, we were able to get, a, we had a lot of support positions uh, that, if I recall, did not materialize until after I left. Because we were there, we were pretty thin. I think we had one or two guys in the front office. <laughs> so you and I, we one did a lot guy, of those. Two supply we guys. did a lot. Yeah, we had one, yeah, yeah, yeah. one supply. We had Donnie, had AK, and Morgan. And I think that was it for support. <laughs> <Morgan>. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I will say. <laughs> yeah, they did everything. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a testament to them too, because like you, you, if you equate us to like some other STS, like that, those guys, those three dudes were doing the jobs of a whole squadron of guys, you know, it was oh, yeah, 25 like, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. And, and I remember like Matt and I, so we've, we've kind of kept in touch over the years too. In fact, and I, I was down at the 17th in 2019, there was a ceremony for Gab. They renamed a, a, a PT a fitness center for him, but I could not believe how many support personnel yeah. there were. And I'm a big <laughs> believer in sometimes more is not necessarily better. <laughs> so you gotta have the right guys. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you got yeah. the right guys. And, yeah. and sometimes like the, to me, the 17th and the tech who we were hungry, you know, we would, everybody was, you know, dual qualified would handle many additional duties and responsibilities to make it happen. So yeah, I mean, JD um, kind of kept their edge. Uh, yeah. JD was op soup, chief of Stanival. Yeah. Armor. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I mean, that op soup job did, was yeah. not, that was no joke, man. I mean, cause like you guys alluded to, at any given time, a third of the squadron was deployed, you know, and at all mm -hmm. times, you know, so in, even with the SF guys, I mean, it was even more than that. And it was just constant like meetings with 720th and like just constant battle tracking. And yeah, it was a, that was a, a stressful job. Yeah. It was, but, but, Matt, uh, but listening to uh, you and Brandy, your podcast, and you brought up a, a good point. So I like to say, I was always a big believer and I know we were on the, we, we were like, I think in Melvin sink, you know, the, the entire time, but because the folks were so busy and with the constant, uh, you know, combat rotations, we were both very big on not micromanaging. Yeah, you guys are great let, at let, that. Let, yeah. let, let in the NCOs run it. And if you can take time off, take time off. You know, I was, I always hit a clock watcher. So I was very big on uh, do what you need to do. Um, if there's something to do, be home, you know, and enjoy that time off because, yeah. you know, you can't pay people more, but, if you can give them time off. Sure. So yeah. we are very big on that. So yeah. you two were the biggest, uh, you ran the biggest defensive screen for all those guys. I mean, they, they and they said it, they, they, it was, you know, they, they really liked the fact that you didn't let all that kind of queep trickle down to them. You know, you let them, like you said, you let them get off, you let them train, you let them do what they need to do. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Remember Blues Monday, we kind of, we kind of pushed off that. <laughs> I don't the Blues Monday, and we never did it. <laughs> Whose brainchild was that in the first place? I mean, come on, what a – gee, many Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, it was great. It was – well, you know, as, as a, as a squatter super at that point, it was great having, you know, CK as a leadership because you listened, you know. Mm -hmm. that, right. that was what was so awesome, man, as you – you know, you've said – you sought advice, and if, if I gave it to you, you may not have always agreed with it, but at least mm -hmm. you listened. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, in most cases, you implemented, which made you such a, you know, a great commander for us at that time, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, your, your uh, successor was a little, 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 little different, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, it was, uh, it, it was nice. And I've always been a huge fan of that. Like, why, mm -hmm. why, why would you, you don't need to overburden guys. But yeah. You know, mm -hmm. if, if now if they start doing dumb shit, obviously mm -hmm. you're, sure. you correct them, you know, if they're OFO all the time. But yep. our guys, our guys were pretty damn well disciplined. And, they, uh, yeah, they, they all were. It was, you, didn't, you didn't have to worry about that. Yeah. So CK, yeah. you're. Uh, I mean, like, I know you, you, you. We've obviously gotten to where you're the commander now, but like, like, what was that? Who, who did you know you were going to be the commander, or was that? No. Just... So actually, uh, an in interesting story. So, uh, so it was the deal of the first year. So, in the Air Force, it, to command, you actually have to apply for a formal board and to screen. So you're eligible for command anywhere. So as you can imagine, those are pretty competitive. Yeah. Um, and so my package, so honestly, my Air Force career, I mean, my time in the Navy definitely didn't help because my duty history was blank. And so I actually, so I didn't uh, make the Air Force Command screening board. Mm. Um, and at the time, so I figured, well, I'll, you know, I'll retire in a year. But, and that's when General Longoria kind of went to bat for me um, 
to fight for me. But in hindsight, do you guys remember uh, Jeff Clifton? He was the regimental fires guy back in mm-hmm. 2007 and eight. So, you know, it's a small world, right? So a couple years ago, he reached out, I live down on the Oregon coast. And um, so he said he had this gig where we supported kind of a sub under Booz Allen. We went out to Europe and we, we pretended to be a staff, right? They needed someone with a, you know, ALO kind of fires background. And, and Jeff Clifton and I, we were neighbors and, you know, friends. And so he told me actually, uh, I, I didn't realize that at the time, but the reg- regimental staff, they actually helped lobby to keep me because they, they had known me from, you know, the late nineties. And sure. so, and, and I had no idea. So it was kind of cool to, you know, to hear about that, but it just goes to show about, you know, you build those relationships. And, Definitely. Yeah. Uh, um, so a- anyways, but yeah, that was, you know, I mean, quite an honor and, and yeah, thanks Matt for the nice words, but I, I will say in at, you know, as an ALO in the tech P world, right? And the whole, in fact, I don't even know if they have rated ALOs now. Um, you know, as you know, back in the day, folks were sometimes drafted or, you know, forced to go into that profession. And sure. I always looked at like I was a tourist, right? This is your career field. You know, I don't, you know, uh, I'm, I'm learning from you guys, not screw it up. And that's where I think ST had the advantages. They had the career officers, right? Who just, yeah. you know, you know, fought for them. Um, I, I assume, I know it's a lot better uh, now. In fact, are there uh, so now are the ALOs basically like TAC POs? Is that how the career field yeah. is morphed now? Matter of fact, one of our buddies, uh, Chris Deaver, transitioned to being ALO. Now he's the the squadron, uh, or he's the in charge of the schoolhouse, right? Isn't he the okay? That's cool. Well, yeah. So yeah, yeah so was, we're getting I'm, there. Yeah. Yeah, I was just at Adam Benson's uh, retirement. And, oh, I'm kidding. Yeah. Yeah, well, a, a, a guy that I used to work with at the 14th. He was one of my airmen. Actually, is an A1C, Tony Glessner. Mm-hmm. He's uh he's going to school. He's putting on 06. And he's going to get a group. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, so he's a guy that, you know, started out as a, as a young tech P ended up becoming a, I think he became an air traffic controller because there was just limited options for guys, you know, mm-hmm. at that time Then he yep. came back once they opened up tech P officer, he came back to the career field and you know, now he's going to run a group. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see. And, and you talking to people, that's probably something we all lobbied for, for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. For sure. I know JD yep. did, you know, yep. and, uh, it, it's mm-hmm. come to fruition and, you're seeing the dividends of it. Yeah, it's yeah, really no, cool. That, that's great. Yeah, I'm glad to see that for the the TACB community definitely deserves it. Yeah. And also it's really cool to see just the whole integration, right? With the, you know, TACP and all the, the STSs and, you know, the seamless integration, the 720th. And it seems all the folks, the leadership, uh, you know, <clears throat> the NCOs from the 17th all end up at Hurlburt. You know, work yeah, for the right. 720th or I guess now the the two for the, the wing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, so really, I mean, really, I don't want to, you know, so Evan Serpa was the 720th group mm-hmm. chief, like last year. So that's Evan, that's awesome. Evan was here as a group chief. And then Matt Davis is now the 724th group chief. I don't know if you guys knew that. That's wow. so cool. That is so awesome. Yeah. So, so, you know, and we all knew those guys were rock stars. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And, and they're all, you know, they're all TJ's the 492nd command chief out here. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's guys in like senior leadership. Evan's mm-hmm. now a command chief at Ramstein. So there's a, there's a lot of guys that have that have just done phenomenal things mm-hmm. with yeah. their career. Yeah, it's it's yeah phenomenal to see it. Yeah, TJ, he spent a lot of time on the Hill, right, working with Congress. And oh, that's right. Did. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he sure did. Yeah, it's funny. So on, on LinkedIn, it's kind of how I keep up with some of the folks, <laughs> right? Know, with, with, with what they're doing. And LinkedIn uh, used to be like lame, and now it's like that's a pretty good avenue to get some good info on people. It, or, yeah, you know, link up. It definitely. So, so I had a question for you guys. Um, and I know, Matt, you really had your finger on the pulse for a while when you're working with you know, MAG and, you know, you were not only, you know, going down range and, uh, you know, supporting uh, training exercises, but, you know, the 17th moved under the, uh, you know, the two, four, I guess, formed a group. And now the 17th has moved under that. Um, yeah. And they've just, so they were running their own assessments. I went to one of the graduations, me and Lalaverte went up there and uh, we spoke at it. So they were doing their own OTC at Fort Benning. Wow. Well, now um, everybody's going to do one OTC up in uh, North Carolina. Okay. And, and then you can go, I'm a, I, from what I understand, I didn't get a chance to talk to Matt. Something came up and I couldn't talk to him. But uh, everybody's going to essentially be interchangeable. You're going to go to one OTC, one green team, and then you can end up at either place. And that's whether you're a red wow. hat or a black hat. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, because there's that. There's a, there's combat controllers at the, you know, obviously they were, they were the leadership there for quite a while. You know, Chris yeah. Larkin was a commander there, um, at the 17th, uh, mm-hmm. God, who else was there? Um, TX. Anyway, there, there's been, 
Yeah, TX Tracks Tracks was there. Was there. Yeah. Their last commander was a controller. It's actually funny. Their last commander was a, a Stowe yeah. that had previously been an army guy. And he pulled me aside and he said, the worst, the only thing I'm worried about these guys is that we're spoiling them too much. And I kind of started laughing. I'm like, well, <laughs> really? <laughs> they, don't, they don't spoil them, you know? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, right. But, yeah. Yeah. But they've got, they've got controllers, uh, combat controllers now on RRC on the teams there. And, and they've just mm-hmm. gotten bigger and bigger. I mean, really? I don't want to divulge <laughs> numbers here, but it literally is one guy per platoon with some fluff. So, mm-hmm. you know, which has always been crazy. the goal, you know. It's always like we've yeah. always, you know, I, we we thought we were, you know, doing good by having a, one JTAC per company at the Rangers, but yeah. then, mm-hmm. but then like if a, if a, three different platoons go three different directions, and you're like, now nah, what do I do? You know, it's almost like mm-hmm. the same just the same problem they had at the battalion level. So yeah, yeah having a having a JTAG for platoon is optimal for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, well, it's pretty good. So, and Ben, I, I know a couple of years ago you had told me that, uh, well, you know, the regiment too, of course, they had been developing their JTAC program and you had said that it had gotten very squared away too. So now there's, I would assume, because deployments have been less frequent, I, I assume the regiment in at least some capacity they've been continually deploying uh, in different parts of the world. But I would imagine now it's even more competitive. I don't know. I know they, they still have their guys. I don't mm-hmm. know if there's as much emphasis on it as there was, you know, before. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm not one to be able to speak to that. But, uh, you know, I mean, we, we met the manual requirements that they asked for. So, yep. I don't, you know, unless you're just ma- trying to maintain guys to be fires guys, you mm-hmm. know, I don't, I don't understand why you would want to maintain a full complement of, of dudes. But like I said, that's that's a that's a Matt Davis <laughs> question, probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now the SF side, I can tell you because I've been doing a little work with Mag. Uh, they mm-hmm. they're ramping up their production of JTACs. Uh, oh, really? Okay. The Army guys, yeah they they go through SOTAC here. They have actually they have a uh, they have a pretty squared away program to try and get guys qualified. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. It's just you know they just obviously like anybody else need their leadership behind it. But they go to SOTAC here at Hurlburt, then they go down to Avon Park, knock out a bunch of controls, and then they go out to New Mexico and do quote unquote, if you will, their uh, you know their uh, MQT mission qualification training. Okay. And then, right. and then if they pass everything there, they go back to their home station, get a check ride and they're a JTAC. Okay. So, so yeah. I know the CS have had their JTAC program for, you know, a long time. Now, you know, I, you always read how ST and I've even TAC P uh, support SEAL teams, but I'm not aware of any. Are you guys aware of any of those missions or I mean Outside ST of- I think have, but but not uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Outside of the guys in North Carolina, I probably yeah. I don't think anybody's doing really any more Mm-hmm. They've got their, they've got a pretty robust JTAC program. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of weird changes going on. So I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I kind of have my ear to the ground sometimes where I hear conversations <laughs> happening about mm-hmm. what's going on. And, and it's it's funny. A lot of it is uh, we're it, – it's all cyclical. So we're all coming back to what they were doing before. And right. I know. You're kind of laughing because it's like, oh, you know, I, if it works this time, good on you. But <laughs> right. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in it. So Yeah, I, I – Exactly. And since, you know, you've spent time in Hawaii, <clears throat> really interesting. So, you know, after uh, the 17th, I ended up, you know, as a pack I uh, had a staff job. Um, it was pretty interesting. I was thinking, how busy could it be? You know, pack, we're not at war in pack or, you know, in the Indo-Pacific ar- arena, but just like anywhere, you know, the military keeps you pretty busy. But yeah. what was very in- interesting, though, is that when I was there, you know, I'm, of course, I met a lot of, you know, uh, folks from the, the Marines and the Army, uh, you know, Schofield and uh, K-Bay. So, 2010 was the last combat deployment for, uh, it was, I believe, 3rd Regiment at a K-Bay. And then 2012 was the last combat or OEF deployment for Schofield. In fact, uh, I knew uh, uh, Colin Tooley, I think he was a, uh, the battalion commander. But it was interesting then talking to some of the leadership and I said, is morale better or worse, you know, now that you don't have that constant deployment? And what was interesting is to hear from, you know, leadership is that morale was worse because a lot of you guys joined, you know, and they felt like they missed out. Yeah. And as you know, in the Pacific, you're kind of tied to Korea, right? So um, it, it was interesting to hear that perspective, how the the folks, you know, in that PACOM AOR felt like they were missing out. Right. And that's now well over a decade yeah. without well, yeah, you know, well, combat I mean, experience. Think about, if you if you want to put it in perspective, think about our retention rates at the 17th for guys, mm-hmm. you know, uh, be it SF or, or Rangers. We had guys that were, I mean, full, had families doing all their stuff. They're gone all the time, not just deploying, but training. You know, they're in harm's way. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the most dangerous missions you can put guys on. And, I mean, how many guys can you think of got out? 
Yeah. Nor wanted to leave the seventeenth. Yeah. Nobody wanted Nobody to leave. Yeah. I mean, yeah. No. yeah. So so I, I understand that. You know, now that are, now that it's gone, it's kind of like I don't want to say what's your sense of purpose, but it's it's definitely diminished. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. If you're just preparing for the next thing, plus along with that comes budget cuts because you're not yep. over. I mean, we were all in in the '90s. We saw it. Yeah. You know, when, when when you're going down to DRMO to try and get kit because uh-huh. you, right. you can't get any kit. You know, yeah. I, I laugh. My first my <laughs> first duty station was Fort Bliss, Texas. And I remember talking to the commander one time because I they would sent me to jump school, and uh, they paid me per diem while I was there, and he lost his mind <laughs> because our annual budget for that <laughs> unit, which was a brigade size TAC P, was mm-hmm. thirty eight thousand dollars. Wow. That, yeah, and I just blown like ten percent of it, you know, at jump school, <laughs> and he was I, he was he was losing his mind. You know, I'm like, yeah. don't blame me. You sent me to jump school, <laughs> right? But, uh, <laughs> You know, but, but yeah, so, you know, and I think about, I was spent, you know, we were spending that per almost per person a lot of times sending you guys out mm-hmm. the door with new yeah. kid mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. So, yeah, so I, I feel in mean, match likes opinion, I could be wrong. I don't, I'm not, like I said, I don't know what's going on, but I, I think you're going to see r- some rollbacks like that. You know, training is going to slow down a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's going to mm-hmm. obviously slow down. It already has. And mm-hmm. we see what, re- we see what's going on with recruiting. I mean, nobody's getting, you know, I know. Yeah. Numbers are way down. Yeah, it's amazing how you yeah. we learn these lessons and then we forget it. it it's just so true. We just keep like mm-hmm. you were saying, it's cyclical. We you know, they cut down the man the, the tag P manning when we first came in, Matt. I remember that it wasn't like oh, yeah. I don't think when when Clinton yeah. got in, they were like, All right, cut everything. And then, you know, uh J Tag training wasn't that a bit wasn't a big deal and then all of a sudden G Y kicked off and I was like, Oh no, now we need more and then we had to try yeah. to make these uh-huh. J Tags and it was very hard and you know, uh, and now they're trying to cut them again. And it's just like, do you not learn from, you know, <laughs> from what we just did? We just did this. You I, know? Yeah, uh, I know. Yeah. And, yeah. and budgets are fake anyway. So, I mean, yeah, if, for sure. yeah, we, right. can't, we can't be $30 trillion in debt and really believe that budgets make a difference. So <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's be real here, guys. You know, yeah. just, just give guys what yeah. they need. You know? Well, yeah. the only person it's real for is the guy on the front line. I mean, they're like, well, we can't yeah. afford to buy that body armor or send you TDY. It's like, well, you, but you're spending all these millions of dollars at the top levels, you know, mm-hmm. this fake money up there. But if I like, if I want to go to jump school, uh, it's, you know, you can't go because it's a quarter of our budget or something, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, CK, you mentioned, you know, you, you about being Marine, you know, a Marine. When I was at, uh, when I first uh-huh. got to Asadabad in 06, um, one, five Marines were there. Right. So okay. we were, uh, we were the ODA with one, five in, <laughs> mm-hmm. in the compound. There was an Omega team there. Um, mm-hmm. and then we had one, five Marines and us. <laughs> I'll never forget the Marines, man. Those poor dudes, you know, this is 2006. They're running mm-hmm. around with their M16 A2s with, yeah. I mean, opti- I'm not kidding. Optics, some of these guys had bought themselves and brought over yeah. and had them like taped onto their weapon. Yeah. It was, just, it was, it was sad to see. Yeah. I mean, we've been at war for four years now and these guys are, and then I look over and, you know, the Omega team's running their guys. And I've got these Afghans that look like, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> you know, look like a CAG troop running around. <laughs> but I'm sitting there going like, really? Like, like, come on. Yeah. What, what's good? What's wrong with this picture here? Yep. They had M4s, man. They had air <laughs> laser pointers. I mean, ACOGs, yep. everything. And I was just like, wow. But yet you got these. <laughs> United <laughs> States Marines don't have that good kit. Yeah. Exactly. hundred yeah. percent, man. Yeah. It was, it was, it was funny to say. I've always had a, you know, a, mm-hmm. I don't know, a place in my heart for the Marines. Cause they, for sure. They, yeah. They, they yep. do the most with the least, you know. Oh, all, for sure. They, they, they run on hate and motivation. You know? <laughs> yeah, no yeah. that's true. Well, and, and, and the Marines get at get at it. You know, one of my deployments out of uh, Seymour, we were flying at a, a, a cutter, but the mission had to fly it was about an hour and a half trek up to Iraq. But our favorite missions were either doing soft support or the Marines. Yeah, because they actually were doing something. Right, right. right. Yeah. Uh, the other time it was like you know NTISR, right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's usually a JTAC or TACP and a jock, <laughs> right? <laughs> Controlling you, exactly. so, like like nobody was out of you know, out on the objective. Yeah, do you uh, do you have any good stories from the seventeenth? Yeah, so just a, well, a couple. Um, like I said, I mean, you guys have the really the, the the cool guy stories, but really kind of more you know observations. Like, but uh, so when I did the TF seventeen fires, right? So we were um, at uh, Biopia General McChrystal. Uh, pretty phenomenal. It was interesting. In fact, uh, I, that was actually a very enjoyable tour. So I worked with um, uh, now General Colin Tooley. He was the three, I was a J3 fires. Um, so at the time we were working on a lot of kinetic strikes in uh, Sauter City. And it was pretty fascinating having to coordinate with some of the conventional Army aviation MQ1s. And we actually 
Uh, it took uh, about a, a month or two, but we were no kidding doing real time targeting, having MQ1s lays for army helicopters, Hellfire missiles in the Sadr City. Remember, nice. had a low CDE. So I just remember like that was pretty cool and was very interesting. And Matt, I don't know how much if TF 17 changed because uh, I know you did a fires down there back in 09. But it was interesting. We had the uh, 175 folks. In fact, Woody was down there. Um, but it was it was interesting. We had two strike forces. and But it was a East Coast SEAL team, right? White SEAL team, I think. I forget it was, whether it was team two or four. Yeah, but the two strike force teams, it was like three quarters Navy, uh, one quarter army ranger and vice versa right so you had this mix this melding of your rangers and seals and, <laughs> and i remember because i got a few trips down there just to kind of observe see how they're running things and they had the seals commander was in charge right you know running it and then under tf-17 but uh, the seals you know were wearing jeans and cowboy hats and chuck taylor's <laughs> or <laughs> beards and, yeah the rangers a little more uptight but it was interesting to see how by the end of the deployment, you know, they would kind of morph, right? The, yeah, the Rangers became yeah. a little more chill. The SEALs became a little more squared away. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that just what, what I notice is, I mean, nothing could beat the Rangers for the discipline, the the, the planning, right? The mission planning. For sure. And, uh, and I know we had some young SEAL officers in our jock, and I know they, uh, I think, professionally developed some of the, um, that skill set. So nice. that was kind of neat to see in some of the work. And, you know, like I said, we did in Sauter City. Uh, one memorable time, it was... Uh, which really kind of highlighted how much danger, uh, you know, our guys were really in every day. Um, it was one of the missions Woody did. Um, and where this is when he basically said just ground force commander, you know, he's, they're getting shot at. It was a half and they came under uh, fire immediately. So anyways, and you remember Woody got shot right through the hand. Yeah, so, yeah. But I was able to see him. Um, uh, he got medevac to, you know, biop and, you know, to see him in the triage and a lot of other wounded. And so that was for me the first time, I'd seen somebody who'd been shot. I, mean, I know yeah. you guys have seen seen this a lot, but for me, it was just kind of kind of made it real for you. It, it made it very real. It was yeah. yes. Uh, fortunately, Woody bounced back strong and you know re recovered. And um, yeah. in fact, I think I remember Matt Davis. He was on a SIP team. I think he had to replace Woody on that deployment. And um, anyways, yeah. and then, then I, I know we wrote up Woody for a lot of awards and so. Yeah. <laughs> We we well had deserved. actually seventeenth. We had a great string. Uh, uh, oh yeah, of uh, award winners. I will say that as one skill set I, I picked up when I was a, a Seymour Johnson, the director of staff, and that's where I cracked the code as civilian secretary. She basically taught me how to the code right <laughs> uh, for yeah. Air, Air Force riding OPRs, EPRs awards because everyone came through, and I think uh, I, I think that was the one way I was really able to help the folks, you know, with. Um, you know, we, like I said, we did very well with uh, making sure our folks got the recognition that they so rightfully deserved. Yeah, I'll yeah. say those. And where going to AFSOC was the right place, that was the right um, organization to be under. I will say it did hurt slightly because now all of a sudden we're competing with some top folks. Oh yeah, and and so you know, and of course we're kind of new outsiders. So I know we. Uh, the awards went down a little bit as expected, right? You know, sometimes apples and oranges, you know, we're all new. So that, and plus, you know, we're competing with the two, four, right? So, yeah. So even for myself as a commander, I mean, that's who I'm, those are my peers I'm competing with, sure. and, you know, for yeah. our folks, but again, it was the right place to be. Um, but, it, but it's just really neat to see that, yeah, you know, how many awards uh, our folks won and rightfully so. Um, Oh yeah, I, I I was I heard this podcast. I think you had with Chachi, and he was telling me about uh, his unit at Carson, and they put him for the NCO of the year was some support troop who stayed home because uh, he had better community service, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which, like well, I said, that, I mean, I get the I get the mindset. You know, you want to be competitive at that at the higher levels, but come on, you know, these guys yeah. are out there getting after it. We're at war. These are yeah. combat warriors. Yeah. Come on, they, you know, let's get yeah, I, well, I had the exact same thing happen to me in <laughs> Hawaii. I just got back from my deployment. So um, I was the first Air Force guy on the island to deploy. What? Yeah. To, wow. That's oh, amazing. Yeah, right? so, That's awesome. So it sent some Marines down, but I went over there. I come back and they put me in for, you know, these awards. Uh, I, <clears> one of I think NCO of the year. So I'd won it for like the 15th Air Base Wing. And then, um, mm -hmm. and I think I was going up for PACAF or, or something, yeah. whatever, whatever it was. And, um, I remember I lost to a guy 
and they're on Hickam. He was a dental technician. And, you know, you know, like reading, you know, you're reading mine and, and then it's like, then you read his and he's like volunteered X number of hours, completed X, X number of hours of school. And I, and you know, I was like, okay, whatever. But I remember talking to the, I don't, I don't know if we had command chiefs at that time. Yeah. Or not. But anyway, whoever it was, we chief. And I said like, what could I do better? And they're like, well, yeah. you know, you need to, you need to go to school and you need to volunteer. I was like, well, I was, I was deployed for eight months and yeah. we didn't have internet. Yeah. Like, we didn't even have electricity. We, I was like, so, so help me out here, man. I yeah. yeah. Understand this. He's like, well, you know, it's, that's just how it is. And I was glad to see that mindset change throughout yeah. where the guy's actually going down range started, you know, it's like getting, being recognized. And you brought up, you know, when, when we were at ST competing, I, I never, you know, and I got to be careful what I say here. <laughs> I never felt like we were necessarily set to the side, but I will say we had guys in, that did as much, yes. if not more mm -hmm. than our counterparts and, mm -hmm. and, and received lesser awards. And for sure. when we did have a guy like Tommy case and we put him yep. in for his second silver star mm -hmm. and, and I had to sit there and listen to, you know, some of the leadership go, well, you know, I remember, do you remember when yep. Wor Worcester was up at the, he came to our the 17th, it was him and Brad Thompson, mm -hmm. Colonel Thompson, remember, and yeah. the, the gunship guy is briefing and talking about what Tommy did. And mm -hmm. here's, you know, here's Tommy, you know, 15 meters away from the, the guys above it, you know, smoking these dudes. <laughs> and I remember General Worcester looked at it at Colonel Thompson and was like, so, so what do you think, Brad? And he's like, well, sir, you know, I, I don't, I don't really know if that warrants a silver star. Oh my gosh. And I, I'll never, I, I'll never forget. That's the first time where I was like, oh man, come on now. Really? I've read some of the silver stars that have been written up for other guys. And I, I yes. like, I'm not trying to diminish what they did, but, yep. but don't, don't, you know, poo poo on what Tommy did because you know, exactly. might, you might have another two silver star winner, you know? That was like the epitome of a of what you would give a guy a silver star for. I mean, he was like, you know, there were there were actual <laughs> army rangers that were not advancing. So yeah. this air force guy goes ahead of you know he's shooting guys with his personal weapon. He's controlling. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just yeah. of course putting himself is, in, yeah, in between the threat and I know friendly. Right, right, yeah. Ages, yeah. I mean, like everything when you read about gallantry, like that's I'm not saying that's yeah. a definition. Yeah, close. Yeah, that. That was an intense mission. What well, I was going to say. Yeah, you were. I was going to say I you had, were involved, kind of with that. I, you, I was. A, yeah, so I was at three seven three fires. Um, I think he was at time was at Salerno, and I remember yeah. early on when I first showed up, um, the fire test was being filled by someone from Jasoad, so I was able to kind of travel around, you know, visit everybody, and saw Tommy there. But even the precursor to that night, it was. Um, so I remember I, I was with remember Mug McGuffey, and we sure. were kind of tag oh, teaming yeah. day and night, and I remember we both got woken up and. This was, it was a no kidding, a real time, like time sensitive mission. Like this, I think it was a Hindu Kush. He's, you know, 10,000 foot plus mountains, you know, right along the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan. So yeah. Muggs and I were working to get every single asset we can. So I remember we were diverting. We got B1s and F uh, Strike Eagles and multiple gunships and U28s. We had, we're getting HIMARS. Um, <laughs> Uh, Hornets, A-10s. I mean, we, we had the biggest stack and we were doing pre-assault fires. It was a half mission and it was, and I mean, like real time, you know, via, you know, controlling via SATCOM, you know, passing coordinates. And I mean, we put this together in like, you know, min time. And, um, and I remember it's pretty intense. In fact, we actually had, uh, you know, we had our uh, you know, TOT and then, you know, the, the helicopters landed. And then unfortunately we had, we had this HIMAR section, uh, I think it was Brandon Mino. He was in charge of him. He had been the yeah. two, two, uh, 275 F, so great guy, but they kept bragging about, Hey, you know, we have this awesome capability. <laughs> we should be more involved. <laughs> so they had their chance, but like, no kidding. A minute after the, uh, the helos landed, we're still having HIMARS coming through. Then we had to oh <laughs> sc scatter the stack. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> what's going on uh, anyway it's pretty dynamic but yeah sure. we're, uh, then we have the squirters and i was actually at that then kind of doing control and talking to the a10 we had he was doing like the tack a and according with the gunship and it, i remember that was a uh, pretty intense like right i not being there like you know 
where Tommy was on, on the ground, but from the jock perspective, it was, we had a lot of senior leadership and everybody's watching. And then of course we're battle tracking what's going on now. As you know, from the talk, right? Everybody can be that armchair quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Cause you know, you only, you're only here in the SATCOM and you're only seeing what you see via the ISR feed. So right. yeah, limited perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I remember, but Tommy, yeah, he, he, he was a, a true, true hero, you know, phenomenal well, performance. And it was a, it, what I loved about that is, you know, Tommy ended up when he left the 17th, he went up to uh, North Carolina, um, mm-hmm. worked up there with Avtag. And, uh, you know, he, the story he relayed to me, and I don't know if you talked about this or not, JD, but, you know, he, this, this goes back to relationships. You know, he went to General Votel, and, and General Votel asked him, hey, what's the status of your Silver Star? And Tommy's like, well, it's been downgraded to, you know, Bronze Star Without or, mm-hmm. or it was waiting to be approved or whatever it was. Right. And General Votel's like, Send me the information. I'll take care of it. Wow. And it was General Votel that no that award and pushed it through. So, nice. you know, like I said, you, you, you know, come back to what we initially talked about, man, that relationship and your performance with the, mm-hmm. with the Rangers, like they don't forget. Right. Yeah. That, that's awesome that it, you know, unfortunately took an army general yeah. that mm-hmm. knew, that knew Tommy and knew the situation. It was like, okay, this is, you know, we, we got to correct this wrong. So, mm-hmm. Because that was a couple of years after the event, right? When it finally got approved. Oh, yeah. 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 It was years but, afterwards. Gosh. I remember a bit another memorable time on that deployment, too. That's when uh, Richie Douglas was deployed with his RRC team. Yeah. And they had a combat jump in. It was kind of cool to see that. And, yeah. Yeah. He uh, talked a little bit about that. He was on here a little, probably a year ago now. Uh, okay. But yeah. He went over that a little bit. Although, man, that, the, the thing about it is like, the regiments had a, a lot of um, static line jumps, and it, you know, however they were, whatever. But those the free fall combat jumps were so hairy, man, because you can really uh, every single one of them, everybody got hurt, or they had some sort of injury, or some, some sort mm-hmm. of issue, and you know, you can really mess yourself up on a night free fall mm-hmm. jump into some unknown DZ. I mean, you you know, if you don't know if you're going downwind, I mean, you can really get, get hurt. So those are very, those guys, man, that's a, I don't know, man. That was a, that was a very, uh, very harrowing experience yes. for him. And Q yeah. too. Q had, Q had yeah. one similar situation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So he could barely see his, like, he's like pulling it in. He could barely see his GPS and like mm-hmm. couldn't see anybody ahead of him. And oh man. Yeah. Just, yeah, no, no. and I know where Richie landed too. That was uh, jagged rocks. I mean, that oh was, right, right, right. Th- yeah. There's there's no DZ. It was, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, no, Richie, P, there's no pea gravel pit out there. <laughs> no, no. But he was just so calm and cool about it. And just yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, the, the, the consummate professional. So. Oh, that's his mo. Yeah, Mr. Laidback. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey. Hey, CK, I, do you remember, uh, I don't know, J.D., if you were on this trip or not, do you remember our one trip to uh, New Mexico where we did the big okay. cast trip? We did a lot of trips. I think that was my last farewell trip. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that was, yeah, we had so much fun. Those were by far the best ranges. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a Doso. Well, no, I'm not, talk, I'm not talking about the one. With, no, wait, were you there at the time we almost strafed? We were almost killed? Yes, I was out with. Yes, we was it a German tornado. I was just talking to. Uh, I was just talking to Ross Robinson yesterday about this very incident. Yeah, yeah, we were in a car and uh, they didn't get the word. I think they had rounds about a hundred meters from us. Yeah, oh yeah, right, right out in front. Yeah, right out in front. Right, right yeah. across the front of the vehicle. I I got in the day after that happened. Like I yeah. I, I was like I can't make it out. I flew in the next day. And I'm like yo, and then I think wind picked me up. And he's like, "Man, did you hear about what happened?" I'm like, "No, what? <laughs> what? I had no, no idea." Yeah, it was amazing. Well, what's oh. funny about that? So I was just out in New Mexico visiting okay. uh, my friends and you know my my Mexican family out there. Oh yeah, and, they're great. I love them. Yeah, Angel and Danny. Yeah, they're actually Angel coming out Danny. here this summer. Oh, All right. But uh, if we were talking. They had somebody over there, and he was a range control guy. Uh, he's a guy that runs all the ranges out there. It was pretty, pretty interesting. And uh, we, I brought up that incident. He goes, oh, I, I, I remember that. And I was, like, I was like, oh, okay. I was like, well, do you know that? He goes, yeah, you guys went on a range without being cleared. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. no. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me give you the real story about that, what really right. happened, and how magically yeah. the, the tapes disappeared. Yeah, when the exactly. Started. Uh, yeah, that was a... That was a that was a fun trip. I mean, other than you know, almost getting strafed. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had a, a lot of great uh, 
training trips out there. In fact, my first trip, I went out, I think Tommy was kind of training me up and, uh, and then that was a big change to doing cast. Remember uh, JD, uh, Benny back in the day, we did a lot of OP cast oh, yeah. for Benny Ranch. So we got a lot of air, I will say. I mean, like I think weekly. Yeah. yeah we used to have that reserve uh, Hornet squadron out of uh, Lanny, but I remember going out to yeah New Mexico. I mean, yeah, but, but we were, we were dynamic. I mean, we were moving. I mean, it was yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, definitely. Uh, well, that's the thing that I, sense. when I, that's the thing I noticed when I got out of there, or when I first got there, I, I, you know, I had only known Germany and, you know, I had been to Bosnia or whatever, but it was like the dynamic portion of the cast was not even uh, a factor for me. You know, like I didn't, mm-hmm. we didn't move around. It's like you, you got on the OP and you got your binoculars out and you found your target and you wrote it on your map mm-hmm. and that was it. But like when I got to the Rangers, Jazz was like, and Kenny, we forgot to mention Kenny Lindsay. Jazz hey, and listen, Kenny, yes, stud, yeah. those guys, they were like, oh, no, no, put that stuff on your, you got a radio on your back for a reason. You got to be mobile. You have to be able to move. And uh, I, I took that to heart and just did that for the rest <clears> of my <throat> career. I mean, and when every time I'd go to a range and see like a, a Tech B or some a JTech that was out there <laughs> not doing that. I'm yeah, like their table, you, their table set. Yeah, you said, <laughs> I, it blew my mind. I was like, you, they said a Lawn field chairs. table. And they, they taped their map to the table. And I'm like, what's uh, going on here? What are you guys doing? So yeah, it was it. Yeah, seventeenth had a high standard. In fact, uh, one of our cast trips out, uh, yeah, New Mexico. I think Brandy hooked me on my first J Tech wall. Oh, he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, then I had to do a repeat with him months later uh, oh. before deploy, and it was with him I passed. Yeah. So, yeah. There was so they yeah they there were no um, gimmies. No. <laughs> no. Heck no. In fact, uh, we had we had one ale. He he failed his check right a lot several times. Yeah, Matt, you remember? Um, yeah, what, yeah, we don't need to say his name, but yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> but it's a different. It, it, but you have to do that at that at the 17th yeah. because that's what you're going to be doing in combat. I mean, you, Matt, you alluded to it when with all the stack that you receive, you have to be know you have to know how to deconflict airspace. You can't stay in one position because the Rangers don't stick around in one position mm-hmm. for too long. You got to be able to move. So yeah, it's, it wasn't, you know, people, a lot of people thought, man, they're hard or, you know, they're really picking on me. It's like, dude, we're preparing you for what you're going to see in, yeah. in combat. I mean, that's just but, the way it is. Now, I, well, I had two things to add there. You know, I don't think we ever gave hard evals. I think <laughs> sure. our evals were, were thorough, but fair. Right. Okay. I mean, you weren't trying to, and it, it wasn't, you weren't given different evals to different people. It was the same cut, you know, it's the same premise. So either you're going to pass it or you're not. Right. And, and I'll, I'll never forget when I think when I was the officer, when I was running a stand eval and AFSOC, when we first moved under them, hmm. they, they questioned us. I'm like, Hey, why do you have so many Q2s and, and failures? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, that's just a, a really high rate. You know, all of our other units have all these Q1s and Q2s. I was like, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're not, Maybe it's not that our guys are that bad. Maybe you're just, you know, giving these guys a bunch of softballs. You know, right. mm-hmm. it's like, don't look at us because we're holding guys to a standard. Maybe you need to look the other way at, at your other units and wonder, what, you know, how 15 guys get EQs. You know? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think we ever gave EQs at the 17th. I mean, you had to, you, you better be, I don't know, Johnny on the spot. To, right. Mm-hmm. And a lot I of those. Matt, I might have gave Matt Davis an EQ just because he was so amazing. But that's okay. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of those, a lot of those Q2s or failures were the first time they yeah. ever saw. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like we were, you know, I wasn't, you know, hooking you or you weren't hooking me and we're hooking, you know, it was like these guys just got the unit. They weren't, they didn't know how to do what we wanted them to do. So, we, you know, we had to mark them down so they could get mm-hmm. that training and, and get 100%. better. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. It's, and I never looked at, you know, if, if you failed an eval to 17th, man, that's nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> no. I mean, cause it's, I, I will say it was definitely, <laughs> It was harder than anything I'd ever been given at any other unit in my life. Yeah. Um, but it, but it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't hard. It was, and it was realistic. Mm-hmm. This is right. what you're going to be doing, dude. You're going to be displayed. You're going to, you know, you're going to VDO and you're going to run and you've <laughs> got to be talking to your assets while you're running to set in isolation or to get yeah. to your mm-hmm. BP. You know, it's like, it's like, no, man, this ain't, we're not doing anything that guys aren't doing every single day downrange. Right. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be With, overlooking a target area per se. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, maybe yeah. they did that in some respects, but usually you're going to be in the fight. You're going to be in the target yeah. area and you have to deconflict, you know, the airspace and you have to be able to know where you are in relation to the target and your friendlies. And, you know, you're not going to be just up 
overlooking everything. You're going to be in the yeah. mix. So you got to know. Or, yeah. Or you're going to do a half and walk 10 kilometers <laughs> right, through, the, exactly. through the mountains and then expect yeah. to control. Paul Ford used to give those evals back in the day. I mean, he would give me one of those. We, we infilled, uh, I can't, what's the name of that range at Benning, uh, that we did, you're talking about. I can't remember what it is, but yeah, we infilled way mm-hmm. off and we had to walk through the woods and we had, to, we came up on the OP and we had to sneak up on it. So it was, yeah, that was, uh, that was where I'm kind of my first taste of that kind of stuff. But yeah, he, he, he gave some thorough, thorough uh, evaluations. <laughs> yeah. Didn't he win? Like he was, uh, I know he, he was very proud. He was the ACO Fister and, or, or a, with the ACO Fist, but I think he won the Fist competition. Oh yeah. Right. That was yeah. like the first time attack he had won that. So yeah. In, first time an Air Force guy had won cool. a Ranger uh, Fist competition. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was hard, but yeah, just like you, but, and it was so interesting to see the, the role of the JTAC just, just morph too. And when I saw, you know, an OEF, not only you have a whole, you know, stack of ROS, right. You managing that airspace and, um, and you had a lot, so many like demand and unmanned ISR, EW assets, EP3 could be a, yeah. you know, rib yeah. joint. And, and there, there's so much put on that JTAC. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and on the SF side, what I can attest to is like, I was a 240 gunner. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, you know, I was in the back of the NTV on the 240. So like, I'm, I'm the suppressive fire guy if we, you know, make contact. So it's like, you, the, you, you end up doing a lot of different tasks, which was awesome. I loved it. But at the same yeah. time, mm-hmm. you're like, you know, it's like, okay, what takes precedence here? You know, am I, am I a 240 <laughs> gunner or am I controlling airstrikes? Like, well, yeah. That's a great point do? though. Like, and you can attest to this because you've been on both sides, but we did get really spoiled on the ranger side because like you said we just <clears throat> talked to the fires desk and they would give you all your products and they'd be like here's all your assets and you'd go in on missions and you you would have all this stuff whereas in the sf world sometimes you didn't get anything sometimes you were no. the you know sometimes you and you wouldn't give any you had to do all your mission planning yourself you had to do all mm-hmm. your ROS, you know for and all that stuff and uh yeah that's that was pretty challenging yeah. and, <laughs> you know? and if you and a tick for like on that side too like because the assets were tied up everywhere else yeah. like, you had to be literally in a firefight because you would say hey you right. know, so you know this is whatever jag one six was my call sign in um oef it's like i wore troops in contact state the nature of your tick and i'm like state the nature of it like, <laughs> you know? yeah it's like okay so you would have to go like hey is it direct like how bad is it yeah the- yeah like, how, like <laughs> how bad is before we move assets like let me know what how bad this is and i understand that because guys would just naturally you know one mortar mm-hmm. would land it within the wire and they're like oh god what you're <laughs> yeah, yeah which which actually happened to me in 2006 when i got to abad we got we were taking rockets from the hilltop uh-huh. and uh I, and they're like get you need to get cast here and i was like i was like dude man these guys are gonna be gone and and they're not gonna by the time we get cast it's gonna be a moot point yeah i'll no, get cast so they're, they're yelling i was like all right man so i call up hey uh-huh. i'll go through the whole rigmarole through the asoc yeah. They pull a B-52 from all the way on the west side of Afghanistan to come over to support me. And by the time that ch- that, that dude checked in like 45 minutes later, bro, I was the only one on the rooftop. It was just me. The team's like Everybody else probably eating- asleep or eating chow. Yeah, they're downstairs eating chow. And I'm like, you know. So those guys, those guys checked in, fangs out, ready to drop some bombs. I'm like, hey, man, you know, you guys give me a quick scan of this ridge line. But that's all I got for you. <laughs> Who knows if those guys were even there? They they could have just uh, you know remote detonated or it could have been on. Time they weren't. Yeah. We called it yeah. five o'clock Charlie because we used to get hit from the same OP all the time at like oh, yeah. in the afternoon. So if you remember from Mash, the the guy flying the plane, he would drop the bomb every day at five o'clock. Oh. And the, the people on Mash would bet they had a target out there and they'd bet on it like who got closest. Um. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we called that guy five o'clock Charlie because every oh. afternoon he'd, he'd shoot like three or four rockets down to day bad. Jeez. Yeah, never found him, never saw him. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But it's funny you were talking about, yeah, uh, having to justify a, a tick. But as you guys know, but working for the TF, we could, by the authority, you could pull off a conventional tick to support an admin movement. And yeah. So, and this is where you, because I would, would work with the, Matt, you, and you did this when you were in fire assessing, you know, working with the soda, right? And of course, we always had the priority, but I always tried to be judicious and good stewards with assets, right? Yeah, and sure. again, it's a relationship. And that's what I learned even my first deployment, where we might have the positional authority um, you know, to utilize assets, but if you have to use your positional authority, next time people won't want to work with you. And so it's always about maintaining a good relationship, good mm-hmm. steward. If you can return assets, do it. Sure. Um, finding a common bond it's yeah yeah building those relationships even if it's you know with conventional units so right right that's the one thing i learned from you know 
working with the you know the rangers and, you know, yeah the, yeah the task force yeah so. my, my first time meeting lark was actually and i didn't meet him <laughs> oh yeah was, was in 07 when i went over there on a I uh -huh. brought a, uh, the soda fires desk in Balad, and i was trying to get a gunship and he he's mm -hmm. like you, you basically told me i can't have a gunship blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> and I, it was all over the phone he was over at uh at uh, the siege of soak and finally i was like all right that's fine. He, oh it, 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 I just was like, well, here, t tell my battalion commander that the tenth group. <laughs> and he goes, and I hand him the phone. He's like, no, 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 no. And the commander's like, so, so tell me again why I don't rate a gunship. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he, he called me back later. He's like, you didn't have to do that. I was like, no, I, I, obviously I did because you weren't yeah. going to like me. So. Yeah. Remember <laughs> and that was funny. always. A and then he became a then he became an ALO waiter, or as I call oh, yeah. him, I called him the Galo, the gunship airway liaison officer. Yes. Yeah. yeah, he was motivated. But I remember the, the gunship, that was a bit of my existence because it was such a high demand uh, asset and both deployments. And you're right, it was it was tough. And even within the task force, you had competing, you know, yeah. you know assault teams, you know, fighting for that gunship. And um, it, it was tough. I mean, there are only so many. Right. But I mean, ev that, that platform is probably the best at night, it's the best thing you can have. I mean, it, you know, helicopters are great. You know, A-10s are great. But a gunship, it is, without a doubt, probably the best cast platform in a permissive mm -hmm. environment, obviously, right. that you can mm -hmm. have. I mean, they got the best sensors. They got they got guns. They got, I mean, they're just, they're on it, too. And they they know almost as much as you do about what's happening, about, you know, what's going to happen on the on the battlefield as far as, like, controlling yeah. the, them. And, you know, they mm -hmm. make suggestions. And they're, yeah, they're just, a, that's an excellent platform. Yeah, yeah. They're, very, they're very tactically aware. For sure. Yeah. Remember, so in uh, uh, so, you know my first ALO tour, we got to do a lot of uh, rides on the gunship. Remember, we're doing like some bilats. And yeah. Did you ever get on one? But it, it was eye opening too, where you'd have you know the products, the GRGs, and kind of being that liaison on the gunship, you know, supporting. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ranger mission. I remember we did it for about a week, and I think we we're maybe I was tag teaming with the the, the FSO, but but I rode on a gunship was, once, uh, and mm -hmm. it and I it was cool to see what goes on but the missions are so long that like i was like this i got it yeah i'm gonna rack out man i get the gist all right i don't need to see anymore it's like what do we land it's it it commendable to them that they can go up there and, and be attentive for that long but i was like man this is going on too long i'd rather be on the ground i used to tell a guy people always want to do isr rides fam rides over and you know in theater and I would, yeah. I would get people, but I'd, I'd tell them, I was like, all right, man, I'm going to tell you how it's going to go. You are going to, well, this is going to be really cool for about the first hour. <laughs> yeah, and, right. and, and unless they get into a fight, you're going to hate the last three. And they were, uh, like, they were like, what do you mean? I was like, oh, you figured it out for yourself. And sure. Yeah. I come, yeah, you're right, man. It was great learning stuff. And then I was bored out of my mind the rest of the time. <laughs> right, yeah. Especially especially if you're just, you know, soaking an area and not yeah. you know, watch it build and pee up powder in life. It's just like, mm -hmm. this, this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah well that's what all the fighters are doing too you know whether you know yep. sniper or hunt. i mean yeah yeah we, we used to say we're doing cast really that was ntisr sure yeah <laughs> look at route michigan look for ieds hot spots yeah <laughs> that's a typical mission oh yeah yeah oh boring <laughs> yeah boring hey well, i was gonna say just one quick uh one more story i was I just that uh, pretty interesting from 373 and if Matt, you guys remember that was a time when uh the regiment kind of took over from the navy yeah deb grew and then yeah mm -hmm. colonel clark he was uh the rco and uh yep. it, was, it was amazing to see that kind of transformation i would say that was a very intense place yeah um i, I don't know if either of you worked there i, I like 17 was a smaller command 373 i was yeah it was super intense um probably the most stressful uh experience i, I ever had it was one of those uh daytime, I got woken up and it was one of those like, time sensitive targets that where it was in the very uh, far part of uh, Western Afghanistan, right? So we had a HVI and remember like uh, very strict, uh, you know, rules of engagement. Yeah. And so, you know, until, hey, we have a correlation, this HVI is in a truck. So we have a limited window. So talking with uh, the CAC, trying to get and, you know, coordinate with the Kayak and get a couple of pair of strike eagles. Fortunately, they had SATCOM radios, you know, back then, even like the Navy Hornets didn't have it. So and we had an EP3, the EP3 is tracking this vehicle. And so I'm trying to do a talk on to get the you know, strike eagles on. I said, make sure you hit the tanker before you show up, right? Because I don't need you bingoing out. You know, those are the instructions. 
And at the time, and so trying, as you know, trying to do a talk on looking through like a sensor pod on a plasma big screen TV, right? <laughs> right. And I have the whole jock, everybody's there, the deputy <laughs> commander's there, everybody's listening, <laughs> watching me. And I know I have a, a, a finite period. I'm telling EP3, pass a coordinate, you know, I need a stake in the ground, right? And trying to describe, well, look, look, it's desert terrain, right? Yeah. And in the debrief, I found out later that the coordinates that the EP3 passes around its sensor is like a five mile perfect circumference oh, of where, where the sensor's looking. So by the time I actually had the strike eagles talked on to the, the, um, the truck that's moving, because once it pulls into a compound, it's over, right? Sure. And the strike is, uh, yeah, we're RTB bingo, bingo fuel. Oh, <laughs> man. And, and, and it was the most harrowing. And you can imagine I felt this big. And, you know, it was a failure. Yeah. And again, everybody watching, I mean, I couldn't control it. Apparently the Strike Eagles, they, they weren't able to get a tanker before they showed up on station, you know, they were directed to. So, but I just remember, so even though it wasn't out on, on the target, but it was, <laughs> that was, um, yeah, that, that was a nerve wracking moment, probably sure. the most nerve wracking moment in my career. And of course it didn't fail. Then it's like, there's, yeah. Then now they're like, what the hell? No room for that. Yeah, yeah, what the hell? Why, why, why didn't you make it happen? <laughs> you're yeah. right. When, yeah, when you're the when you're the fires guy, man. Yeah, when there's a strike going on, everybody stops and watches. Oh yeah, just, yeah. Like all right, it gathers around. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're all sitting there, and it, and it gives you the commanders yelling at you, like, "Come on, Air Force, what's going on?" Well, it was it was a night, you know, Tommy, you know, in a, in his raid too, because again, we're um, before at the time, you know, they they don't have comms, and so I'm doing it you know, on satcom. Of course, everybody yep. can hear and yep. coordinate with. Fortunately, I had a phenomenal, the, the gunship and the A-10 on uh, station were phenomenal. They were in yeah. rock star performance, but, and they did a great job, but probably wasn't good enough yeah. <laughs> to debrief. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. sometimes I will say the Army, the services, they have an unrealistic expectation of what air power can do. For sure. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's, yeah. They have no idea, and I will tell you from being in the aircraft to actually – yeah, you know, differentiate between friendlies and the target, and I mean, there's a lot going on. Yeah, <laughs> to actually get a bomb at ordnance on the right target at the right time. So. Oh, I mean, it really is an amazing thing. I mean, it, yeah, it, I mean, we we take it for granted on the ground for sure. We're just like, mm -hmm. come on, do it. But I mean, having to fly the plane and like, you know, get eyes on it or look through your sensor or what? I mean, it's it's an arduous task, I guess. I should yeah. say. Well, no one doesn't like the United States military, you know, our for sure. <laughs> yeah, combined fighting forces. So. Oh yeah. Matt, did you have anything else you wanted to add? I was going to tell a funny story about how I used to piss off Kronk all the time when I'd introduce him. But I forgot the first time I did it, but I remember you were so mad at me. You didn't say anything. You were really, you were good about not doing it. But, you know, I, I used to laugh because, you know, Kronk came from the Navy, you know, and a commanding uh -huh. officer there's a CO. So, so I, I introduced you a couple of times. I remember you got so mad. I was like, hey, this is our, uh, this is our CO CK. Oh, yeah. And, Oh, I like that. <laughs> you, nice. So I'm essentially spelling out. Obviously, you can you can spell it. Uh, C O C K. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> he just now got it after all oh, these years. Gosh, he just yes. now got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Oh. But I, but you caught it the one time I did it. You just oh, be like, okay. hey, I, I would appreciate it if you would introduce me like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I. That's one thing I loved about you, sir. Was like every time we'd mess with you, you you took it with you took it in stride. You call, you said it very calmly. You're like, I'd rather you didn't do that. Yeah, that's not okay. That's you know you you never got pissed. You never got yelled at oh, us. Yeah. It was so even yeah. when we we're taping you up or like putting I, I, stuff I, on your back or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I took a lot of shit. Well, we, remember we were driving down. We did a cool cast trip. We were up at uh, um, Outer Banks, Hatteras. We were working the ranges yeah. out there, and uh, was uh, well, I mean. Not Campbell. Um, anyways, I forget, but it, it was a good trip. But yeah. kind of the uh, I remember Dare the County, past, I think it was where it was. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah Dare County. Yeah, yeah, some prehistoric, horrible land. But I remember <laughs> on the way down because we didn't get as much Tomcat support. I'd promise more. Oh, yeah. Riding right. my ass the entire time. I remember. <laughs> But finally, but it was when Q stood up because he was a senior airman. Then yeah. he started making fun of me. Then I had it. Okay, I, that's enough. <laughs> I yeah. my foot down. You're a senior airman. You don't really yeah. <laughs> do give me shit. These guys can. Yeah, right, like, right. Jazz, you, Lindsay. And, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I will say this. You know, I, I, I felt bad. I remember um, when, you know, obviously I was your, your superintendent. You're the commander. And I, and I, I think Brandy mentioned it to me one time. He's like, you know, you're the first senior enlisted advisor 
or senior enlisted leader that didn't get his commander promoted to 06. And I was uh. like, <laughs> I, was like oh. <laughs> I, I guess, I guess you're right. And I, yeah. I, I, that, that always stuck with me. I was like, damn, man, I must've, I must've really sucked as a, a senior at CEO. <laughs> No, no, you were phenomenal. Well, and that's where, as you guys know, with the, you know, big Air Force too, it's it's your paperwork. And the thing is, as you go further up chain, it's, you're always being compared against your peers, right? So and that, yeah. that's in, in, in any service. And no matter the organization, right, there's there's always a bell curve. Sure. So, you know, you think even, a, you know, a tier one unit or, you know, the, the Blue Angels or, you know, so again, it's, and unless you have a consistent career of what you've always been, you know, hey, you're number one among your peers. And so it gets a little tougher. So, but no, you were, you were great. Like I said, I, Matt, I, I miss all of our road trips together too, visiting our guys, training, you know, yeah. um, yeah, in the mountains fun. a few times. I mean, it was a lot of fun. And um, yeah. are you, are you still in three times a day? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on a I, trip. I, I tell you the body, as you guys know, once you're over, once I got to about 52, I mean, the body, I, it, it just hurts. I need a new knee and yeah, um, yeah. So I'm still trying to maintain. And, and then, um, you guys, I probably get your disability. You're probably fairly high. I assume not too bad. Yeah. Pretty high. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys deserve it. I mean, you guys have been on the field the whole time. I, I will tell you seeing big air force, you, you'd be surprised, horrified how many senior officers who were basically sat on a desk their entire careers are like 80, 90, hundred percent. Oh yeah. 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 There's, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of folks like that so yeah 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 I was, it's pretty, I was like, pretty entertaining yep so yeah just, just one thing i wanted to say uh, just kind of in, in closing too so uh, i think i told you matt but probably like two best comments i ever got from you know senior um you know uh, ranger leadership you know just about the 17th um one was after my first uh, fires tour i had about a week and a half i got you know relieved and i was up in mosul with um I forgot our, our 275 uh, so but i was able to you know kind of go out with him on target but, uh eric carilla he was a uh, you know oh, battalion yeah. commander 275 commander he's the he same was there. Uh, uh, i know i i knew him very well as uh, my first tour he, he was a company commander you know i watched army navy game at his house we did so many triathlons and, um so <laughs> but i remember when i uh, anyway so i mean you know eric carilla of course he was an 05 at the time and um you know, he was cool with me being up there. And he said, don't remember, he's my guy, right? <laughs> you guys are mine. But it, but it was so cool that the fact that they just thought of uh, the Air Force guys as as Rangers. In fact, yeah. and then Colonel Tooley said the same thing. He's, we were mentioning like augmentees. Um, and he said, uh, our, and he said, well, we, I don't even consider, you know, your Air Force guy is a, I mean, you're, you're just Rangers. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're one of us. So to me, I just took that to heart. Like, yeah, the, the seamless integration. And, uh, you know, when I think of the men of the 17th, phenomenal. I mean, everyone was a rock star. And, um, man, I think we had maybe two little minor discipline issues that, you know, I don't think <laughs> all the guys <laughs> are. <We, laughs> LOC, I remember that was kind of tough, but, you know, yeah. I mean, it was yeah, a, a little momentary lapse. There's only one, what I would call a little negative turd or stain. And he was a non tac P. Um, remember you and I, we got some, uh, I think a formal letters of counseling that are all these I did. Oh yeah. Colonel, yeah. Colonel Thompson, uh, yeah. and it yeah. was our, our former first shirt. Yeah. I remember <laughs> I, I was, I was actually thinking about that. Yeah. yeah I don't, I I don't, did that. you know, that, you know about that JD? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, me and Colonel Cronk got paperwork because he filed a complaint against us. Our, our first oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's you. He just did like you, and I have. Been, I don't. Yeah, know. I don't know what you. For what? I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I know. I'm very familiar. I, I'll, I'll tell you the quick story. It's pretty funny. It was, so I'm a. So this guy had left. He was our. He was our first sergeant. He, we had had some issues with him. He showed up when Brandy was there. You were still there, JD. He yeah. Was, uh, you know, uh, he sat in. Well, you know, the first sergeant's office. Yeah, he yeah. Placed, yeah. Uh, Garris or whatever his name was. And uh, like I said, we, we had some, we knew we had some issues with him because he'd already complained about a couple things going on there, uh, especially with like the 15th guys. It's like, dude, that's not your concern. Don't worry about it. Right. But anyway, uh, he didn't, he didn't get stratted. Uh, we stratted this guy named JD Welsh, uh, number one. And then uh, <laughs> he ended up making a senior master sergeant. So, yeah. so that guy took that personal. The first sergeant took that personal. You know, uh, even though you had uh, busted, busted your ass, you were going right. to school. Oh my God. I mean, you were, you were crushing it as the op soup, you know? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah. so I, I think you were number one in the group, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'm not for sure. that year. Yeah. Anyway, so he was a little, a little upset about that. So we had a, a situation where we had these, uh, remember the old quads we had there? At the 17th? Yeah. 
Yeah, they, they were just beaters. Yeah. Well, I, t- I sent a couple of the guys downtown. I said, hey, we had a place where we took them. I said, take these quads down, yeah. see what it's going to cost to fix them. We got we got funding, you know, and, and they come back and they said, hey, we talked to the guy. He said the condition these things are in, it's going to cost more to fix them than it's worth, than they're worth. I was like, okay. He said, but he did offer he'll buy them from us if we, you know, if we want to sell them to him. So I'm like, well, I don't know what the legality of that is. This is government equipment. But I, I find out, I find out that those had been purchased with, uh, you know, fall off like early on in the war, like 2001. They got purchased with money. Nobody could trace them. They right. weren't on a CACRL. Nobody had them in any inventory. I even called, um, you know, I even called uh, Warren <laughs> Robbins and said, hey, are you guys, nope, don't know what you're talking about. Okay, right. cool. So we so we could not turn them in. We couldn't turn them in. Normally, you would yeah. dermo those things. They're like, you don't have any record of them. We can't dermo them. So I went to the first sergeant. I said, hey, do you think we could sell these? You know, I, here's all the steps I've taken. Can we sell these and use the money to go into our, you know, our uh, flower fund or whatever it was called? Yeah, whatever yeah. We, we called it at the time. And then that yeah. money would be used for the guys, you know, when they come back. Mm-hmm. He goes, yeah, I don't, I don't see a problem with that. Go, you know, go ahead. So I talked to talked to CK and I said, Hey man, this is what's going on. You know, and you were like, okay, yeah, if it, it sounds good. You know, if he's good with it. And cause I, I want to make sure like no issues with this. Right. Mm-hmm. right. So we, we go through with it. We sell the quads, put the money in. Lurk was there. Lurk actually took the money, put it into the <laughs> UAC account. It never, never, I never even saw the money. It went straight into the UAC account. Yeah. Fast forward about he PCS is uh, retired. He retired actually. Cause I was, mm-hmm. I was deployed when you retired him. CK. Mm-hmm. And right. all of a sudden it's, it's like six o'clock at night. I'm still in the office uh-huh. and, and I hear a knock on the door, the front door. And I'm like, what the hell's my somebody knocking at six o'clock at night? Right. I, I, or maybe it was five o'clock, but it was after duty hours. I got sure. there and there's two guys in suits. And I was like, can I help you guys? <laughs> They're like, yeah, hey, we're here to see, uh, you know, Master Sergeant so and so. And I don't want to put his name out here because, you know, it's neither here nor there. Yeah. And they go, I said, oh, well, I'm, I, he's, he PCS like two months ago, man. I'm, you know, and they were like, Oh, he did. I was like, yeah. I was like, but and they're like, Oh, okay. Well, do you have a, you know, a POC or I was like, well, Hey, come on in. And they showed me, they, they, they told me they were, uh, they were OSI. Okay. I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, cool. I was like, Hey, come on in, man. Yeah. Let me get you uh, I think I have his contact info. So I bring him inside and I was like, well, out of curiosity, like, what's this about? I mean, I'm just, I'm just, you know, if you can tell me and they're like, Oh, we, we need him uh, as a, uh, Somebody's using him as a reference, and we just want to, you know, we just want to talk to him about an individual. So I'm thinking it's for like a job with OSI, right? Right. Says. And I started laughing. I go, I started laughing, and they go, they go, what? Like, they're like, that's an odd response. Why, why are you laughing? I was like, well, no offense, but that's the last guy I'd want want to be a reference for me. <laughs> and they go, really? I was like, I was like, I was like, yeah, man. He just, you know, was like, he retired, and probably it's a good thing he did because he was gonna probably find himself facing some you know some issues they're like oh well, do tell so i bring them into my office now right and we're talking we're going back and forth and they're like well what you know i was like well you know we just had some pro- we had issues with him you know we had i explained some of the situations we had one of them he was he was like you know womanizing he he lent our vehicle our our gov vehicle to this female that he was in a relationship with an, an <laughs> army female and she yeah. wrecked it totally oh her. no remember that ck <laughs> She yep. told her, right? <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So I was like, oh, you know, so I, I lay all this stuff out, and they're like, huh? So they're like looking around my office, and they're like, well, hey, mm. we really appreciate. It. I was like, yep. I gave them the info. They leave. So anyway, <laughs> fast forward now. Me and CK get summoned down to the group, <laughs> right? Um, now you got to realize, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting. You know, I'm testing for chief this year. Uh, I think I've been stratified. Uh, got a, mm. the group took really good care of me with my stratification mm. and everything. And I go down there, and I'm like, I don't know what, I don't know why we're there. We just, we got to see Colonel Thompson. Yeah. yeah. And La Monica pulls me aside. He goes, Hey man, I don't know if you know why you're here. And I was like, no, I have no idea. He goes, well, you're, you're, you're going to get paperwork. And I was like, paperwork. Like, For what? <laughs> and he goes, so he tells me, you know, he goes, well, you know, evidently you sold these hum, these four wheelers and then pro and then took the money. And I was like, what are you talking? <laughs> oh my God. I didn't take the money. You know? I was like, the money went into the UAC. You know, I explained all the thing to him. He goes, well, he goes, I'm like, holy shit. So I'm thinking like, okay, my career's over, you know? Oh. And, uh, and he, and, it, and I'm like sitting there, I was like, okay. He goes, Hey Matt, just, just take the paperwork. It's not going to affect anything. It's not going to affect your strat. It's not going to affect anything. Okay. I'm like, well, okay, that's fine for me. I said, but I hope Kronk's not getting paperwork because he had nothing <laughs> to do with this. He's not even tracking this. This is all me. 
I said, this, yeah. I made this decision. This is me. He goes, well, you know, evidently he knew about it. I was like, he didn't know shit about it. So, he me. <laughs> so they're like, whatever. So I have to go into Colonel Thompson. I have to report. Just like, like you know, I haven't done this since I was, since I was in Korea. Getting my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, walk in, salute, report, yeah. and Paul Thompson's there, and he goes, you know, man, I, I'm, I, I hate doing this, you know. I, he, he goes, I've, I've just been told by Jag, blah blah blah, that this is what needs to happen. You know, this has to be some sort of accountability. And I'm like, he goes, I'm sure, <laughs> he goes, I'm sure you've never gotten paperwork before. And I started laughing. And I, was like, <laughs> and I said, I said, and he looks at me, and, and I said, well, not for something I don't feel like I deserve. I said, yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> And, and I look, and, and Lamonica's laughing out loud behind me. He's laughing his ass. Off. And I was, and I was, he goes, "Well, you know, just, just, just take it." I was like, "Well, okay, sir, can you please explain this to me? Tell me, like, what, what should I have done? I laid out everything I did, you know. Yeah, I did that. I did that. I did that. He's like, I said, "What did Jag tell you that I should have done with these these vehicles?" He said, "You should have went and dumped them on the range." What? I said, "So, so I should have taken them out and created an environmental hazard on the range." <laughs> And he and he goes and he goes he goes and I I never heard this man cuss in his life, dude. He was very religious. He goes, damn it, Matt, just take the paperwork. It's not going, to it's not going anywhere. I was like, All right, sir, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, so so uh, the first sergeant filed a complaint against me and CK, saying yeah. that we sold those for profit, and then we took the money, and I don't know, I guess got hookers. And what, what a jerk! <laughs> what a jerk! Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeez. So that, uh, yeah, that, that was the uh, the infamous. Oh my god. Because uh, when when I got to uh, the seventeenth, there was, we, I think we had uh, some folks PCS, but we had no money for a plaque. I'm like, that, that, that's, yeah, that's insane. And so that's where remember we started selling some gee dunk and yeah. hats just to raise money. So yeah, we wanted UAC, to yeah. have, we wanted to provide everyone who left you know something nice. Uh, right, right. You know, I think we had a cool plaque done and photos anyways but yeah. yeah it was the whole purpose of it so yeah that told me it was good but it was like what can you do <laughs> i know right <laughs> we always just kind of laughed at it. i was like yeah yeah <laughs> i'll tell you what though there, that's one person if i ever run into again it's gonna be a throw oh yeah <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> I'd say it yeah but i thought it was funny though I'm, I'm just spilling my guts to the osi guys and not knowing it's me they're investigating yeah so, uh, <laughs> they probably that's you know as it went on they you know, that's how investigations go. They probably found out this is nothing. Right. The LOC is the lowest I can give this guy. Let's just, because, yeah. yeah. because once he gives you something, you can't get anything else. So exactly. Yeah. And yeah. that's what it was. They were like, we have to give you something. That's <laughs> what we did, Matt. So <laughs> we, we had the two little incidents that, you know, some Liberty incidents, a couple of our folks. And I think it was just the LOC that just stayed and yeah. got torn up. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 see, I felt a, like we tried, no. you know, I, I felt like we tried to take care of guys, even when they screwed up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you did something oh. that was, you couldn't, you couldn't, you just can't. But, you know, I always remember back JD and, and CK, you probably the same thing, but you know, when I was a younger airman and JD knew me as a younger airman, you know, I was out of control. I mean, I was, I was I mean, fight. I think we both were. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, and I had, I had NCOs that took care of me and gave yeah. me second chances and, and said, mm -hmm. you know what? Hey, you're young. You're going to learn from mm -hmm. this, you know, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, so, I always kept that in the back of my mind as a senior, you know, when I became a senior NCO that unless it was just so egregious that I couldn't do it, if right. it was a learning point, I, I'm, mm -hmm. you know, it's a forgive and forget, give you mm -hmm. a second chance. And I will say this, what I was very frustrated with was a lot of my peers that I saw that were the same as I was when I was younger mm -hmm. and got those second chances were the first ones a lot of times to hammer young guys, yeah. you know, and, and almost career ending situations. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. What are you doing, man? You right. Know? Like, why would you do that to a guy? All you've done, you know, give the, at least give the guy something he can recover from. Don't exactly. just make it your, your, you know. So that was uh, especially for guys who were like squared away. I mean, I think that's what kind of saved guys like you and me. Yeah. Yeah, we went out there and acted foolish, but then we also tried to do our best at the job. You know, we were we tried right. to stay in shape and we tried to do the job as best we could, and we, you know, we did it. We did our best. It's those guys that you know don't do their best at work and screw up that those are the kind of guys you you should probably hammer but right yeah like you said if you if you got a kid that's like he's just kicking ass at work and just doing the best thing he can possibly do but then you know maybe had a little too much to drink or did something stupid mm -hmm. yeah you'll give him a break i mean if i there's plenty of times where if i would have got those breaks i'd have been done you know and yeah. i think i thank all my supervisors for that and i'm sure you're the same way and you know we always allude <laughs> to korea 
But <laughs> yeah. had, it, had any of that stuff gotten out, we, we wouldn't have been where we are at all. <laughs> I mean, yes. gee whiz. Oh, 100%, yeah. man. I mean, yeah. it's so, yeah. bad enough. I, you know, we all got arrested over there. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, you, you had Valella on. He mentioned uh, Montgomery, Captain Montgomery, who was an ALO yeah. at uh, 14th or Debt One. You know, and that was, that was, that was our Colonel Montgomery. Yeah. Uh, and I, I can say if there's one person I ever can say mm-hmm. I owe my Air Force career to, it's that guy right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. He was he had awesome. A very, he had a very long leash for us, uh, <laughs> yeah. but which probably too long in a lot of cases. <laughs> right. But uh, he, he allowed us, I mean, he protected us when we screwed up. For and, sure. Uh, yeah. And like I said, I would have never, I would have never left Korea with, hell. I should have gone to jail <laughs> there for a long period of time. <laughs> Which we need yeah, to I'd like to link up back. I'd like to know where he, what he's up to nowadays. I mean, he I was would, yeah. probably one of the best ones I ever had. Yeah, and he was like you, uh, CK. He actually, uh-huh. he became, he was a young captain ALO. He was a pararescue in Vietnam as an enlisted okay. guy. Got his commission, went into F4s, and then um, he, came, he was a captain ALO at the 14th, or the de- wow. at Debt 1 it used to be called. And uh-huh. then he ended up coming back and was a commander. He kind of made, he kind of became a career ALO. He yeah, was at nice. Fort Knox as a commander. Mm-hmm. He was at... Uh, in Korea as a commander and then I uh, ended up going to the group and, and then unfortunately mm-hmm. taking care of his boys got him in trouble. Cause he had a, he had an uh, six that just didn't, didn't play. So mm. yeah, he was great. Yeah. Cool. Cool background. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, but yeah, that's uh so thanks for your leadership too. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you took care of a lot of guys that stood up for guys. There was a lot of guys that right. we, we did have some square away guys that got in trouble. And, um, mm. you know, we were able to just kind of contain it in house and, and nobody knew what, it better. And a lot of times, I mean, just bad luck and timing, right? Yeah, sure. And so, trust me, I've seen officers do far worse egregious acts, but what usually when we were out, we were always able to kind of police each other and sometimes mm. just, just again, bad timing, right? Mm-hmm. And it's certain incidents are very subjective. Yeah. <laughs> For sure, <laughs> we're not. That can ruin someone's yeah career. <laughs> but again, you can't let it go unpunished. You know, just JD. I know you have kids, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> like your child, you know, you want them to learn from it. For sure, for sure. It's got to be commensurate still, with the crime, for sure. But you know, yeah, you still love them. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Good. Well, listen, great to see you guys. And uh, if you're yeah, ever same. on the Oregon coast, come. We'll we'll go to the Tillamook Cheese Factory and go squatching and clamming and hunting. Yeah, squatting. Yeah. Like, looking for Sasquatch. Squatting, yeah, you got it. Okay. It takes a lot of beer drinking, and you go after midnight into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like snipe hunting. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. So, so, JD, when is your interview? When did one of us get to interview you? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once I get, I think once I get through everybody in the career field, then we'll we'll go back to me. And uh... <laughs> I know, I know, you have a lot of great stories. Yeah, I mean, I, hopefully they just come out organically and stuff like this, you know. But uh, I, that's the thing. It's like I, there's so many dudes out there, like you guys, and you know the guys I've had on, and the guys I'm fixing to have on. I mean, it's just I, I feel like I want to capture all those all those stories and have them, have have them on record, you know, for people to see. I mean, I don't think enough of the the this country knows about you know guys like yeah. you. I think the the Tech P career field has been, and people that are affiliated with the Tech P career field have been under kind of unsung, you know, I mean, for, mm-hmm. for the most part, I mean, which I guess, you know, being silent professionals, I think, you know, people have that argument, but at the end of the day, I think yeah. I want more recognition for guys that have actually, you know, been like, especially the 17th, I mean, it was in, integral in winning all, both those wars. I mean, the OEF and OIF, I mean, that there were, if without guys like you guys and, you know, and everybody we mentioned, we we wouldn't have the success we did. I don't think. You know, I think, it, and that's not. I don't think that's hyperbole. I think that's real. Mm-hmm. You know, so. And and it, it's, yeah, and to that level that they've elevated to now. I mean, sure, who, right, exactly. Who, who would have thought? You know, us fifteen years ago, that this would have even been. I mean, I we all had grandiose plans of what the seventeenth <laughs> right. would be. Yeah. I, don't th- I don't think I ever saw it at this level. So. No, I know. Pretty impressive. Hey, J.D., one recommendation for someone, I don't know if you've reached out to him, but I think he would be a phenomenal uh, interview. So when I was in Hawaii, I saw Lauren Bell a couple of times. I've, I've been talking to him. Yep. I, yeah, I, I would I would get him on, too. He, it was amazing just what he told me. Um, he ended up, he said he did RRC, but the guys were going through OTC. Right. Uh, the full up. Yep. And uh, then he went to the 2-4, went through their OTC. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, we're trying to link up. He, he's busy. Okay. He's a busy dude. He's all over the place. But yeah, we're, yeah I'm trying to trying to nail him down. So hopefully yeah, soon I'll have Japan. him on. I think he's in Japan for a little bit longer. I just talked to him the other day. Okay. Oh, he, reached, 
And then he's coming down to, he's going to be in LA for a little bit. And he's going back to Montana where he's doing, he's doing an internship there. Oh, good. Wow, yeah. Cause he retired right about he a did. year ago. I think that's what I thought. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm definitely, um, trying to coordinate something with him for sure i definitely want him on the, on the and cast an, another guy i would recommend and i think he's still in so i'm not sure how much he can he can disclose uh is ryan donnelly okay have you had matt ryan. davis on uh no no he's still in too so i think yeah. a lot of the guys are apprehensive that there's you know the guys yeah. are still in or yeah and especially um, the units that they're at <laughs> right 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 yeah i definitely want to grab those guys once once they get out um but yeah i would um yeah, all those guys I want to have on eventually. For oh, and, sure. and Adam, right? Yeah, he's retiring. Soon. Yeah, I'm, and I'm gonna. He just retired, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit him up here pretty soon and see if he'll come on. And yeah, yeah, I was telling JD um, before he came on. I was at uh, BN's retirement last week. Okay, yeah. nice. That looked he pretty was fun. A consummate professional. Yeah, oh, yeah, the best. Always, always. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he always had the weight of the world on his shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's yeah, what the yeah. you and I we, we could we could laugh a lot. I mean, we I think we definitely had a zest for life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You two were perfect together. Let's just put it that way. Perfect command team, right there for yeah. sure. Yeah, both my you both the opposites, you JD and then Adam. You guys were the perfect yin to my yang. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, Jay, you're pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing, as you guys know too, is with, with the Rangers, for better or worse, you're only as good as your last mission, and right. they have a they have a short memory. Sure, uh, and so it's like you're always having to. It just seems like you're always having to prove yourself, right? It's yeah. like, and it's almost like it's never enough oh, because, no. as you as you know, you have to do all your Air Force training, JTAC training, but then you're supposed to do every single you know Ranger event. In their defense, they hold their own guys to that standard yeah. too. I mean, it, sure. they they don't let any slack mm-hmm. go, you know. So you screw up yeah. one time and you're RFS. So. Yeah, I, I remember one time I, I was talking to the guys and they were like, hey, uh, just so you know, man, so-and-so fell out of the run the other day. You know, I forgot what they did, a company run or something. I was like, I was like, oh, okay, well, I appreciate you telling me that. They, I already knew they had told me. I'm like, well, uh-huh. I, I mean, and they're like, yeah, it's kind of a big deal, you know, the Air Force guy falling out. So I was like, well, how many Rangers fell out? And they were like, well, like eight. And I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> like maybe he had a bad day. Like, Yeah, you, exactly. Why are you hot? Why, 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 yeah. why are you spotlighting the Air Force guy? You want to say eight <laughs> Rangers fell out too, but you're not saying like, hey, man, eight Rangers fell out of the run. It's like, it's, oh my hey, gosh. the Air Force guy fell out. It's like, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my okay. God, that just reminds me. So uh, I forgot who it was, but I think they had the, sh- I think they had like diarrhea. Uh, I was going to say, uh, yeah, they probably yeah. had the bubble guts like, or something. Yeah. There was, a, there was a good reason for it, but I do remember when um, some of our support guys would wear, uh, you had to wear the Air Force PT gear. And it was a member of the Smith Gym, pretty rock star. But oh, yeah. I, th- I think one time, a, a, just a regular a, a Army NCO corrected, somebody was wearing their PT gear the wrong way or something. <laughs> the and, Air Force guy? <laughs> yeah, it was an Air Force, but it was like one of the support guys or the 15. But the point is, there aren't many. And the thing is, if an Air Force guy screws up and reflects on oh, yeah. Yeah, everybody, know, right. the, entire, the entire community. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. 100%. And, and yeah, I remember it was one of the Ranger rendezvous, and I, I wanted to get some support to do the you know the regimental run, you know, the five mile run, and I think I had a few support guys into the crisis. If you're gonna do this, no one's dropping out. I, don't care. So I was like, <laughs> like no, no, you don't have to come. Game. Yeah, you stay here. Oh yeah, you you I, can I, come. You know, just make sure yeah, everybody can do it. But, but but the old day we had one of our young support guys, uh, Donnie's replacement supply guy, and he he you know he he gutted it through. It was cool. And then you know. You know, Colonel Clark was there. Hey, seventeenth, way to go! Nice. I was like, "You will finish." Hundred <laughs> yeah, yeah. percent. Yeah. Or just keep running. So. Just keep, right. Yeah. Or just keep going, dude. <laughs> yeah, man. That's uh. I said, appreciate you inviting me back, CK. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I couldn't do this without you. Thanks, JD. Well, I can't thank you guys enough for coming on. I really sure. appreciate it. This is awesome. Oh, well, thank you, JD. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, CK. I'll Great to see you guys. I'll talk to you soon, man. <laughs> Reach out. All right. Let me know. All right. You guys have a good rest of the weekend. All right. See you guys. Take care. Hey, JD. I can't believe I forgot the two most critical takeaways that I wanted to pass on. First of all, uh, to express my gratitude for being able to serve the men of the 17th, it was truly an honor and the highlight of my career, serving as the OPSO and commander. The 17th was a special place from the headquarters at Fort Benning, also housing the 375 RC Regimental Tech P to the Desert Hunter supporting 175, Fort Lewis supporting 275, and the SF Dets at Bragg, Campbell, Fort Lewis, and Fort Carson. We had some great ALOs and support personnel, albeit a small handful, but it was attack P NCOs who truly built the squadron's battle-hardened and highly professional reputation as the best JTACs in DOD. 
You are truly the epitome of the humble warrior, never complaining, always putting in a hundred percent, striving for mission success, and truly making a difference on the battlefield on a daily basis, all while supporting our nation's most elite units. I'm truly proud of each and every one of you, and wish the rest of our military and the civilian public truly knew the inside story of your accomplishments. Finally, in discussing the studs of the 17th, I need to acknowledge two of our fallen brothers who lived the Ranger Code, both in and out of uniform, Josh Gavlik and Timmy Officer. During my time, Timmy was one of our more recent hires to 175, and I remember that he arrived with a great combat-proven reputation, positive attitude, and quickly and seamlessly integrated into the Denton Battalion. According to those who knew him best, he always strove to be a righteous man who would selflessly help and mentor those less fortunate and brighten any room he walked into. Lastly, I need to acknowledge Joshua Gavlik, Gav, who I knew quite well since he was at the uh, betting during my tenure. Gav was the epitome of a true professional who crushed every position he served and every deployment he was on. But what made him so impressive, at least in my eyes, was how he conducted himself off duty in raising a wonderful and loving family of six. Gav was truly the role model on how to act as a husband, father, mentor, and how to host a great party. He definitely made the world a better place during his short time on this planet, but it is comforting knowing that his legacy will live on, and it was my pleasure to have been in the audience back in 2019 when the 17th STS Performance Center was renamed his honor.